never left All India Institute of Medical Scientists, Sciences, New Delhi for 47 years of his life. <laughs> Starting as a medical student, advancing his career as a postgraduate student in medicine, joining as a faculty in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, also his likes, they are called Amazonians, pure Amazonians. They are there and they only leave when they retire. So he comes from the breed of those Amazonians and uh, then advancing to establish the first department of emergency medicine in the country, the Apex Department of Academic Emergency Medicine. I have personally been influenced by his journey because when I wanted to bring emergency medicine to India, I knew that I have to change all India. If I could change the mindset of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, the country's mindset would change. It was very difficult to penetrate the red walls of All India Institute because it's like a red fort. Uh, it is the highest caliber of talent who works at All India Institute. They always have worked within the walls of All India Institute. And I needed to democratize that concept because if All India Institute led the way of the nation in the development of emergency medicine, things would happen. So I walked into Ames and I spoke to Dr. Agarwal. That time there was no department of emergency medicine at Ames. There were faculty in the emergency department slash casualty, but there was no department. They were struggling to have a department for years now. And the journey started and we established the Indusem mission, initially called the Indo-US Emergency and Trauma Collaborative, advanced to becoming Indusem, the brand name, and there's where we are 20 years later, the Emergency Medicine Association, Academic College of Emergency Experts, we have postgraduate programs in emergency medicine, we have all the medical colleges wanting to start postgraduate departments, we have our international journal indexed in PubMed, we have a newsletter, we have an annual congress, we have a world congress, we have national CMEs, we have workshops, a full academic kitchen was created by All India Institute of Medical Sciences and whichever postgraduate students are sitting here, you have that degree or you are going to get that degree because of people in this room. And this all started because of the vision of Dr. Agarwal to not act like other head of the departments and to listen to a young student like me. Because in our country, one thing which we lack in our education system is that the lack the lack of the thrive that the art of education is motivation. In our country, the art of education is humiliation. You humiliate the resident, thinking that humiliation will inspire that resident to learn. And I have always learnt that the art of motivation helps the student learn better. And that is what was difference in Dr. Agarwal. I was very young. So, and 90% of the people around him told him, what will you do? That was the words. But he said, no, no, kuch to kar lega. There were fake degree program runners in this country who rushed to Ames to tell them, oh, don't work with Sagar Garankar. Don't work. And they were all in powerful positions in private hospitals. And they wanted to run fake degree programs. They had a side vision. So they needed to stop somebody who could develop MD and DNB in emergency medicine. And even today, those fakers exist in India. And they stopped, but he didn't listen. And he moved ahead and said, no, we are going to follow the academic vision of emergency medicine because we are the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And he did not act like many others in his position. And he said, let's do it. And we went on to establish the department. We went on to create history and we are still creating it. Dr. Agarwal will be soon retiring in a few weeks from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, but he will not retire from emergency medicine. He will not retire from Indus CM. So this was the right time and it was an executive decision in my power as the head of the organization that I should dedicate the national CME to the legacy of a leader who had the vision to motivate a young resident to achieve what I have achieved. And that is important. You may not be able to teach, but you should be able to encourage people who want to learn. That is very important. He was an internist, not an emergency physician, but de destined to lead an emergency department. He did not ever act that I know it all. Aham Brahmasmi. 
90% of 99% of the people who reach that stage think they know it all and when they don't know the answer they humiliate the other person that is an art which we have and he never followed that if he did not know he would ask he read the whole textbook again he gave a test every month to understand that i should know when i am talking and that is the legacy of a true teacher and that is why the cme is dedicated to the legacy of that teacher to inspire other teachers to become like him because today emergency medicine needs good teachers and it's okay if you don't know emergency medicine but don't teach something wrong arbindo ji always said you can never teach anything to anyone but you can learn everything from everyone and that is very very important and that's what i learned myself as a student from dr agarwal today even though i am the head of the organization dr agarwal never said i want to be the head of the organization he always was said no no you are fit enough to be the head of the organization you should be it i will make sure other things are going on so he takes care of the other things and that humility is the strength of his ability which is the cornerstone of this program's sustainability and that is why this cme is dedicated to his legacy this cme is very different from any society cme held across the country there is no cut paste lecture in which conference does every resident get the chance to give a lecture there was a big confusion i said everybody can lecture to get a podium presentation in the world is the most tough part see the ignorance of our residents they are calling that we want to do poster i was offering them the podium they chose to do the poster that is the level of ignorance in our country to get a podium presentation is higher than to be a poster i opened the doors that a teacher a resident a student can talk together can present together can go together sabka saath sabka vikas sabka vishwas sabka prayas i removed the complete hierarchy and the power struggles in giving a lecture at a conference but see the influence of oppression that the residents couldn't see it and they wanted to do posters so that shows that there is a long journey ahead a challenge in emergency medicine which we have to accomplish and it is teachers like dr agarwal and like him if they get influenced to encourage the next generation to learn this generation is much ahead of us this generation is all about reels twitter this generation knows that when they are hungry they need swiggy this generation knows that if they want a good partner there is tinder this generation knows that if they want to promote there is x and facebook this generation wants instant gratification it is not like our generation when we were young our parents said this generation gap now we are getting older we say it's generation gap it's a cycle but that is not a generation gap it's a generation leap and the generation is moving faster than you can think my young daughters know my children my students know more about computers than i do if i don't be with time i will not know many a times i'm giving a talk i don't know how to move the uh, instruments they know exactly don't worry sir we'll do it and that is very very important the most important thing in upgradation of knowledge it is not like upgradation of iphone or a phone or a uh, android phone or what samsung because there if you upgrade a phone the old phone goes in a garbage in a, in our stream we cannot go in the garbage we have to survive so upgradation of knowledge is addition of knowledge in our field while upgradation of technology is in the dump yard of the older technology so that is where teachers play a major role they upgrade their knowledge and humbly upgrade it a tree which is full of leaves always bends over humility is a part of knowledge if you have that knowledge you will always be humble if you have more knowledge you will always fear not to fail if you don't have that knowledge you will be over confident it is only the trees without leaves which fall down in storms it is the trees which are filled with leaves who always bend over but never fall and that is why teachers like dr agarwal are very very important to this country our cme is very different each and every speaker has been selected through a process and coached for 6 months our cme has no cut paste lectures it has lessons about life it has lessons about personal growth as a doctor 
There is no chest pain, shortness of breath, UTI, pneumonia here. There is people, their experiences, their knowledge. And that's why we come to conferences. If ever you want to come to conference to learn what you should be learning in your residency program, then you are not in a correct residency program. That means your education is not complete. It's the teacher's fault that they are not given you a program that you have to come to a conference to learn, the, learn what you should be learning in those thousand days. Hence, CMEs like we have done change the course of time. These CMEs don't exist in any other specialty. This is a benchmark we are setting today. We are live streaming on YouTube. We will be editing and putting up these talks for you to hear. They are inspirational speakers from emergency medicine. There is a mix of younger emergency physicians, a mix of leaders from other specialties than emergency medicine who have achieved things in life, which will guide you to open your mind, to think outside the box, and to innovate. Everything can be connected if you know how to connect the dots. And that's what this CME is. Our conference has always been the voice of India is the pride of India. Everybody, a resident, a medical student, a teacher, an administrator has a voice to speak. In our conference, if you want to speak, you will get the podium. You don't get that anywhere else. It's a lot of hard work to achieve what we are. There are many societies who claim that they do things. There are 5,000 people who fight for 20 spots in this of being in the leadership board there is no election in our organization if you perform you persist if you don't perform you perish simple and straightforward rule it is only the great leaders and academicians who are form who are found in pubmed if you are not in pubmed you are in the pubs just remember that real science and academicians of a specialty are only found in pubmed everybody else is in the pubs the world looks at you if you are in PubMed. When they look at you, if you are an expert, they don't Google you. They go to PubMed and clear that thought. And that is what our focus is, to be powerful on PubMed. That is our whole end vision. Our whole structure of the Congress, whether it's our workshops, whether it's our innovation, whether it's our presentation or our CME, is built around the legacy of the teachers who started and supported me and the whole organization. Sanjeev Bhoi was a young lecturer when he was in All India Institute when I met him. I got married in the morning and instead of spending time with my wife, I went to All India Institute of Medical Sciences in the evening because I had only eight days. I had to come, get married, go back to my residency in America. So I got married, I got on the plane, I went to meet Dr. Agarwal. Dr. Sanjeev Bhoi, I think, came in a rickshaw to pick me up. And we went to Ames and we sat down. And we sat down in a small area outside the Department of Casualty and wrote the first script for Indus-CM, whose degree you are getting today. That took a lot of hard work to reach where it was. I had only $50 in my pocket when I launched this mission. Today you have journals, newsletter, conferences, postgraduate students, workshops, conference, international presentations comes with a hard journey. 99% of the people in the world, when they go to America, they only think about India once they retire. Desh ke liye kuch karna hai. The plum years of my life, of, I have given it to the country because I went there to develop emergency medicine in India and I could not have done it if there was no Dr. Praveen Agarwal. Hence, we today honor the legacy of this great leader who will never retire until he is there. And this will be an annual event where these 15 speakers today will choose their next successors next year. So if you all want to be a national speaker in the CME, you can start dreaming of that. And these 16 will lead to the next 16, to the next 16. And that's the legacy we are starting. Anybody can be a speaker. So welcome you all to the Dr. Prav Professor Dr. Praveen Agarwal National CME at EM India 2023. Like Dr. Agarwal to stand here and we give a standing applause.
doctor say, ask dr agarwal to say a few words after which dr abhijit sah will take over the way this cme will run is the only break you will have is at 3 hours there should be pin drop silence so please switch your phones off because there will be recordings please switch your phones off security will escort you out if your phone rings please switch your phones off live streaming is going on on youtube if you want to share the links you can prajwal can you share the link so the links are being shared we are live streaming and the viewing room is up if you want to take a break we will stop at 3 hours there will be three speakers each one will speak 14 to 15 minutes the sequence is there there are no questions allowed these are presentations and they will continue till we take a break and after that after lunch we'll do the last session and then we'll go for the convocation so welcome everyone i hope you have a great day dr agarwal please say a few words uh good morning everyone uh i am really honored and humbled i am standing in front of you all of you for this cme i really don't know whether i really deserve this or not um i am really very humbled and honored my name is here for the cme uh when dr sagar talked more about the cme that this should be named after me i told him that this should be named after you not me i said it should be dr sagar garwankar cme not my name but he said no no it should be after your name i said it's okay but after so much of uh, because he is there for last 20 years and em in india is because of him only not because of me but he said no no it should be you because you are retiring in october so he said okay then i agreed after a lot of his position from his side anyway but uh, i would say that uh, the cme is uh, a culmination of efforts from 16 of uh, great speakers who have been uh, uh, working for last 6 uh, months or so uh, they are they are uh, trying for last 6 months they are having hard work for 16 6 months or so i am sure that uh, you will listening to this uh, 15 or 16 speakers over next 4 uh, or 4 and a half hours and it will be really worth uh, listening to them uh, they will be sharing their journeys they are different aspects of their uh, uh, their personal lives uh, i would once uh, i will uh, request dr sagar uh, if you can change it to still uh, has, i think dr sagar will want to see me <laughs> no uh, anyway i will i'll again once again uh, i i am again humbly uh, submission my humble submission everyone that to please 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 uh, don't stop here this cme will continue it's my, against my name but still it is all because of you people that see this cme and this cme is going to succeed in future also so my humble request is that please uh, increase the number of people who attend the em india and the cmes and that's all from my side thank you very much first in sequence dr prerna batra dil hai chhota sa choti si aasha so how many of you have ever held this uh, emotions at some point of time in your life <laughs> so many hands are being raised so i also felt so when i joined university college of medical sciences as a young faculty a very big name among medical schools after all uh, being in premier institute of delhi is supposed to have some aura at least i felt so and that too for someone who started her career from very humble cities of kashi and sevagram socha tha life set hai ab kuch bada karna hai पर क्या ये नहीं पता था एनीवेज आई स्टार्टेड माय जर्नी विद बहुत सारी आशाएं पर हर आशा इतनी आसानी से पूरी नहीं होती सो लॉट्स ऑफ माय थॉट्स एंड आइडियाज वर डिसमिस साइटिंग वेरियस रीजंस लाइक ओ समवन एल्स इज डूइंग इट इन द डिपार्टमेंट और मे बी इट्स रियली नॉट द नीड सो आई डेंटली डेंट हैव मच टू डू एट दैट टाइम आई वॉज टोल टू सिट इन पीडियाट्रिक कैजुअलिटी yes that is what it was called in those days and supervise what senior residents were doing 
again this was not something that i had envisioned for myself but i had to do that so i started sitting in casualty i really didn't feel good at that time but yeah today i don't shy away from saying that i was actually enjoying my time over there i was learning dynamics of a busy pediatric emergency that was catering to 150 approximate patients per day uh triaging was being done and you know who was the triaging officer it was a security personnel who at his own discretion used to decide which patient should be seen first and which can wait for some time and i vividly remember one incident where a small 5 years old child came to me and confided in me the history of suspected abuse of the elder sibling because he somehow thought that i was an authority in that chaos i knew that this is the place which needs some revamping changes are required in that place and then few months on i was told no actually was forced to attend a meeting that was called by some academic college and of emergency and trauma in aims new delhi why i was told i was a junior most at that time but still i was told because no one else wanted to go that to that meeting i was also a baffled a pediatrics ka trauma se kya lena dena meri samajh ke bahar tha but still because no other option left i went the only thing that was there in my mind at that time was uh let's take a break from this routine in of this routine hospital and maybe escape a bit early to spend some time with my young daughter who was just 5 at that time so i went but i never knew that my life was about to change there i met very dynamic dr sagar galvankar dr praveen agrawal and dr sanjeev bhoi i was really astonished to see their passion towards the subject they really wanted to do something about it they wanted development of this specialty and uh, that was a time when i would say emergency medicine was in its infancy only while pediatric emergency was just a preemie who was trying to struggle for its first breath so pediatrician mom inside me just wanted to support that breath and i connected with that mission immediately so that time i was given the responsibility of organizing a two hour slot of cme in the mega event in the cm didn't have much support at that time except for my husband dr abhijit and my young daughter and both of us as a family package went to coimbatore we attended the conference while we both took care of our young one the extra package was the family vacation that we had with that we really enjoyed had a good time over there and then next year i got to meet dr binita shah those who know her will definitely connect with it uh she is a lively very enthusiastic person and with her infectious persona she became a godmother to me she taught me not only the nuances of the subject and presentations but also the skills of managing personal and professional life and then there were cmes there were talks the things were moving on i was having a good time learning pediatric emergency and then another setback came when my institute had decided my future now so what they thought that neonatology was the branch for me so they posted me in neonatology while we were moving towards a good direction we held our first conference of pediatric emergency medicine in 2012 in delhi where pediatric emergency focus was one of the main highlight which was held by dr uh sanjeev bhoi and his team and many international faculty which was an eye opener for not only for me but for many others things were moving and then another set that was neonatology so now what but this time i was not really ready to leave this passion i decided to get myself trained i wanted to rightfully ask for what i wanted what i wanted to do in my life and as the first step i joined fellowship of academic college of emergency experts that was the only structured course in pediatric emergency medicine that was started at that time 
first batch 2013. This time again, I was accompanied by my husband, who is a trained pediatric nephrologist, but he knew that pediatric emergencies, they are required in any field. Even pediatric nephrology or any other branch, that cannot thrive without learning emergencies. So both of us joined the program. The advantage, again, I had that both of us were studying together. We were attending conferences, courses, workshops, and our daughter was accompanying us. We didn't have to bother to leave her at home, and we really didn't have much family support also. So the things moved on, and when we received that degree, after 14 years of uh, MD, we wore that black robe again together. I was elated. This was the time I felt that things are now going fine and I, I was happy, I wanted to do something and decided to move on further. Though this one year was tough for both of us because my husband lost few more hair during uh, this one year, but still it was worth it. So as the things progressed, I decided now that I'll try to utilize whatever opportunity I had. Being in neonatology, I chose my strength as neonatal emergencies. I started publishing research, conducted paper, research and published papers on topics like oxygenation and disease, um, biomarkers, procalcitonin, sepsis, meningitis and so on. So that became my strength. Then we conducted few conferences and CMEs as well. Things were moving fine. A few important papers that came up was management of management algorithm of febrile young infant which was published for the first time in the country we also published a white paper on development of pediatric emergency medicine which became the landmark paper for starting dm residency program at aims raipur so first dm program in pediatric emergency medicine was started also, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, which is the largest body among pediatricians, they recognized IAPPEM chapter and now it's working in close association with INJCM. National Board of Examinations is also starting uh, their DNB course in PM very soon. EM Gurukul, the pediatric residency support. Uh, Emergency Medicine Residency Support Program and Ashmed, Guru, Ashmed, which is the Faculty Development Program of EM. They also recognize pediatric emergency and pediatric is actually an integral part of that program and is moving towards its academic recognition. The speciality of the slot that was a two hour slot in 2009, it increased to a five years, uh, to five days conclave apart and epicon and it's currently a well acclaimed international conference. So my efforts also ultimately paid. I was given the charge of pediatric emergency and acute care in my institute in the year 2019. Though it took me a decade to achieve that. But yes, I could do it and I feel perseverance was the key. What about personal front? Yes, the journey was exemplary there also. So I was carrying my daughter along all the time with me. Uh, she was growing up, I would say, um, with my EM colleagues. She was learning just by subtly observing them. Mannequins were her newly found toys. So she used to recite A, B, C, D, E and was clicking photographs, was enjoying having a nice time. She was Interacting with very wise, knowledgeable adults who were much above her age and was getting some impact on her life. I was often criticized that I am losing on to her childhood because I am carrying her along with her, along with me all the time for my own personal benefits. But was I? No. Actually, she groomed into a beautiful young woman and is pursuing her degree from a very renowned university in Australia. So I'm really proud of what I achieved on both the fronts. So friends, 
opportunity knocks once on your door. It's you who have to recognize it. From feeling like forced into something to ultimately achieve a sense of fulfillment on personal as well as professional front is what I achieved during this journey of 15 years. And here I am in front of you speaking as a PM physician and a proud mother as well. Where there is a will, there is a way. You have to carve your own path. Bahut sari aashayen puri hui, magar bahut sari abhi bhi baaki hai. The famous quote by Dr. Uh, by Guru Dev Ravindranath Tagore, Jodi toh daakshu ne kyao na aashe, toh be akla chadro le, is my mantra to move on. You can make it yours too. Dr. Ajay Amlakate. Hello, hello. How many of you have been to a hill station? Please raise your hands. Yes, that's a good number. Allow me to take you on a journey to the misty and mysterious Vainard. Vainard, it comes from the word Vail Nadal, which means land of paddy fields. It's a hill station too. It's characterized as a mountainous plateau, an elevated plain surrounded by mountains. It harbors a wide variety of plants and animals. 60% of its land area is covered in forest. And it harbors tigers, leopards, elephants, and so on. So whenever I say when I am from my aunt, people do tend to ask me a question. Have I seen a tiger in the wild? Sadly, my answer is no. But you can see how unlucky I am. When this is a tiger, which is just leaping into my neighbor's yard, See how unlike I am. Okay. Why not? Population 50 percent is tribal communities. It's a very remote area, characterized as an aspirational district as per the government of India. What is an aspirational district? Those are those districts in India who have very poor socio-economic indicators. So this remote area has a single tertiary care center. Other centers are 30 kilometers, 90 kilometers away through mountainous roads like this. So I did, just before COVID-19 hit, I relocated to Vainard, my home place, and started working in this center. At this center, Along with my work in emergency medicine, I was also in charge of something that was inter-hospital transport. Soon after settling into, this is a center. Soon after settling into my practice, I was approached by the management to transport a patient to Calicut. Another, for basically to transport another patient to a different tertiary care center. Right? Now this patient was hemodynamically stable did not require any immediate medical assistance. But I yielded to the request because I was new to the place and it was a usual practice. Little did I know that this, would, this event would be the first instance which would open my eyes later. The day went on and finally a patient had come, a 30 year old male who had fall from a significant height, a polytrauma victim. He was hemodynamically unstable, unconscious and hypoxemic. 
being trained in emergency medicine, I was charged up, resuscitated him, intubated him, found out he's having a pneumothorax, relieved it with the tube thoracostomy, resuscitated him with fluids, and slowly he became hemodynamically stable. But there was one thing, his consciousness remained delusive. We had to evaluate him for a traumatic brain injury. He had severe traumatic brain injury, which required emergency neurosurgical intervention. Our center had one neurosurgeon, and he was not available. So I had to shift this patient to a different center, 90 kilometers away, through the mountainous roads. Usually we ship these patients in our own advanced care ambulance. But on that particular day, my ambulance was shifting a stable patient to carry it. Had to find a way. At this point in time, there were five advanced care ambulances in Wynard. We tried reaching different ambulances. Finally, we hired one which was 40 kilometers away. It took 22 hours for this ambulance to reach us. My patient had to wait. This patient was then shifted to the higher center, but then he couldn't, he expired after reaching the fire center. We, they couldn't do much because of the time which was already wasted. But this day too, slowly eroded away from my memory. Close to two months later, I had another wake-up call. A 23-year-old female, a uh, victim of a road traffic incident, where a car had fallen into a ravine. She was brought drowsy, hypoxic, and hypotensive. We evaluated her. She had a massive hemothorax. During primary survey, we did a tube thoracostomy. And then we knew she required cardiothoracic intervention. And our center did not have one. But this time, again, the ambulance was on its way back from Calicut. Last time it was going, now it was on its way back from Calicut, having shifted another stable patient. But this patient was lucky or it was God's grace that our ambulance reached back in time and we shifted this patient to a higher center and she survived. But these two instances made me think. I knew something had to change. Once accident, once an incident could be an accident. Twice a coincidence. But three times signaled a pattern. And I feared a pattern is going to emerge. So I remembered my days of training. When such situations occur, my teachers used to refer something called a Swiss cheese model. So I, based on their, uh, same, uh, based on their ideas, I decided to apply the same model in my instance also. And I found out there were significant flaws in my system. The first was the oversight which was responsible for utilizing the ambulance service was not operational. We didn't have a different tool to sort or prioritize patients who required advanced care ambulance. And lastly, there was administration interfering with our decision to transport patients. So, problems have been found, so we have to find solutions. So the first problem was no oversight. I was made in charge, so I decided to streamline the process, so it was very easy. But we don't know if it is easy, let's see. Uh, the second problem was more problematic. How to choose a patient who requires advanced care ambulance? How to prioritize that? Luckily, I had friends in the Indusum Collaborative who had worked in the realm of inter-hospital transport. I decided to reach out to them, discuss with them, and I learned many things. One of the things was, most of the places use scoring systems or certain criteria to sort these patients. So there were many scoring systems, many criteria. Each was having its own merits. So which one to choose? I went back to them again. And this time, we brainstormed regarding 
different scoring systems. And finally, we came to a conclusion. The scoring system which we should choose should have very simple questions which even the weakest link in my transport chain could answer. So who could be my, who could be that weakest link in my transport team? My team consisted of a single junior resident, a senior EMT and a EMT in train. The junior resident was post MBBS who stayed with the department for maximum of three to six months, a very floating population. This could be one. And the second was the EMT on training. That particular person had the least knowledge and the least experience. So it was imperative that the scoring system I choose has to be simple enough for them to understand and to implement effectively. So we zeroed in on three scoring systems. The RSTP score, the uh, transport trash tool, and a new two based scoring system. Now why did I choose this scoring system? The hospital was already running a rapid response team based on the new two scoring system. So I chose that particular system because they were aware of the new two score. Second was RSTP. This scoring system had more or less binary questions and answers which is simple enough. So I thought this will also be a good scoring system. The transport trash tool even though was a very complex tool, but it had the least number of variables. So that was also selective. Now I took on the charge to train my residents and the EMT technicians on this scoring system. For this, I employed different teaching methods. Through informative lectures, I presented the scoring system to them. This was followed by engaging tabletop exercises with simulated cases which enabled them to practice the scoring system. Now during the training, I found out that the transport rest tool, though I said it was complex, I was thinking that it, it would go through, but then it was very difficult for them. So it was left out. The training continued till all the people could effectively utilize the other two scoring system. Finally, at the end of two months of training, all these people, I gave them an assignment. The assignment was to retrospectively prioritize the patients they had transported in the last two months regarding using the two scoring systems, the RSTP score and the news 2 base score. Now I had two surprises. I always felt that the news to score is going to fare because they were always already using it in patients. They were accustomed to it. But the indirector reliability and the prioritization was better with the RSTP score. So we decided to adopt the RSTP score. Now this marked a breakthrough moment for us because we have successfully found out a solution for one of the major problems we had to implement this new approach. Now I was confident and very optimistic, but then I had to convince my administration. So I went to the administration, seek an appointment. I talked to them regarding how this could benefit the patient care and the health care and everything. They had some very simple questions for me based on numbers, which I didn't know. What is going to be the downtime of the ambulance? What is going to be economic impact for this new approach? I didn't have any answers. I did not have any. So I went back. I was depressed, but I went back. I went back to my drawing board. This time seeking patterns on how to answer these questions. Finally, I found a ray of hope which could answer almost some of these questions. So I went back to the administration. This time, I pitched them the data. The number of patients whom we are transporting to the hospital from outside this district or within the district was very low. And there was significant number of cancellation of these transfer in of the patients because our hospital ambulance was utilized for some other purposes, which was, it was not intended to. So I asked them this. If I were to bring patients to this hospital, 
the hospital is going to generate revenue by transporting the patient into the hospital and also treating the patient. Right? And secondly, if I'm using the ambulance to ferry in patients from different parts of the district to the hospital, it is going to be a free advertisement for you because ambulance has your name in it. Right? And lastly, but not the least, this will increase the perception of goodwill of this hospital, which will in turn bring you more patients. Did I succeed? I would say partially. They were not completely convinced. But my persistence fa proved vital here because they gave me a chance to try this up approach in a different, in a small timeline. Over the next two months, a yes, system slowly developed. Reshaped the way we provided care. And we saw a tangible impact in the patient outcomes too. Now I share this experience with you because of two reasons. The two lessons I learned. Change is possible even when there is a system which is existing. Second, resource utilization has paramount importance in deciding the patient outcome. Also one more thing which I would like to tell this august audience is that this experience of mine highlights the challenges and the opportunities of practicing rural emergency medicine. This could be a very slow process, but it can, even small changes can make life changing impact. Through evidence based approaches and having a steadfast commitment for improvement, we can bring quality care to every nook and corner of our country. Emergency medicine is designed to, ed to exist at the edge of chaos and this chaos is becoming increasingly difficult in rural India. Proper management and competent leadership are required to navigate this complexities. Now, this could be your mission should you choose to accept it. Ms. Pratima Joshi. This way, danger. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? I stand here today, having embarked on a journey in the urban development sector almost three decades ago in the city of Pune. Back then when people asked me, so what do you do? I would simply respond saying that I work with informal settlements to try and create access to basic services that you and I take for granted, like toilets, water, electricity, housing, and so on. Often people looked a little puzzled wondering why an architect was doing this kind of work. But it always surprised me when some of them turned around and actually said, oh, there are slums in Pune? 
Back then, the Pune Municipal Corporation admitted that 20% of its population was living in informal settlements. Of course, they had very little data to support this claim because most of their data was very outdated, scattered between different departments and totally unusable to make any kind of informed decisions. So very early on, we realized that it was absolutely necessary to have accurate, up-to-date, spatial, granular data if you had to even assess what were the critical gaps in the analysis of uh, you know, the services within these settlements, the ones which I was talking about. And so, two and a half decades ago, we made a firm resolve. Let's make the invisible visible. I'm glad that even at that point, and I'm talking about the late 90s, we realized that if we needed to really manage such voluminous data, we needed to leverage technology. So how did we go about it? There were two kinds of data that we've been capturing. One is mapping the settlements very painstakingly, where we map just about everything that is visible on the surface, including structures, common amenities like you know, your water stand posts, electric poles, even the manholes, garbage dumps, just about everything. And on the other hand, we run a set of questions by every house. And this data, which is gathered and the mapping information, it is all integrated onto a GIS platform. So GIS was the first technology that we leveraged, which was followed by Google Earth when it was launched in 2005, which we used as a base map. And then, of course, now we are using a lot of open source tools. We've also published our data on our website, to which most of the cities where we worked have actually linked their website to our website to bring it to a much wider audience. So I'm very happy to say that to date, we have mapped and collected data for over 650 such informal settlements, which house more than 300,000 families. And all this data is available in the public domain, and uh, it's being used and leveraged. So I would really like to focus on how data can become a transformative force in the well-being of people living in informal settlements. And I would like to focus on three areas where we've been able to bring about some impact at scale. So let me start with sanitation. Sanitation has been the most neglected service that has been provided in communities as was revealed by data across seven cities that we have worked in in Maharashtra. I think all of us are aware that uh, across the country, in cities, most of the urban local bodies have only given a community toilet in informal settlements. And we all know how unhealthy, unhygienic, dirty, and tough to maintain they are. And they are breeding ground for diseases. But what our data also revealed was that the toilet to person ratio, which was sometimes one, is, one seat is to 100 or even more people, was forcing people to defecate in the open. So back in 2002, we realized that the only way to provide dignity to people was to give them a toilet of their own. And I'm happy to say that between 2003 and 2005, we had an opportunity, opportunity to uh, experiment with our one home, one toilet model, where we were able to facilitate over 1,000 toilets in the city of Sangli and Miraj. Over the years, buoyed by the success of this program, we, we were able to hone this model. So by the time the Swachh Bharat Abhyan was launched in 2014, we were ready to scale. And I'm very happy to say that across the seven cities where this model had been very successfully implemented, Pune ranks first in the state and also in the country because they just ran with the model. They leveraged our data and 
Today, the swing in needle pre-intervention was just 26% families having access to a home toilet. Today, it is 58% who have access to a home toilet. So what was wonderful about this model? It was a very participatory model. Every stakeholder was involved. It was very inclusive. And it was also a cost-sharing model. So leveraging our data, what every city did was they lay sewer lines wherever it was possible in the communities. We leveraged funding from CSR and provided materials free at the doorstep of the families who are willing to take a toilet. And the people invested in the cost for building their own toilets. So there was a financial buy-in also from the poor families. So what uh, makes me really proud is that, you know, this kind of an inclusive model was such a win-win for every stakeholder. And it's being leveraged very robustly now by cities who really are looking forward, you know, to giving this uh, facility to the poor because community toilets have been extremely difficult to maintain even for the cities. So to date, we have reached out to over 27,000 families with a home toilet only through CSR funding. And I would like to really take this opportunity to, to thank all our donors who have done that. But what's important <laughs> is that the third party impact assessment that was carried out by the Gokhale Institute across four cities where we uh, implemented this, show, uh, you know, where they studied several parameters regarding health, showed vast improvements in the physical and mental well-being of people um, across these communities. But to me, the most rewarding moments were when young adolescent girls would say very spontaneously, oh, now I can eat and drink at any time of the day without having to worry about going to a toilet. <laughs> or the tears of gratitude that poured out from that young lady's face where she was married for five years and for the first time, she could invite her parents living in Pune to come and visit her in Sangli because she had a toilet. Which brings me to the second focus area, which is the pandemic. All of us know that the pandemic had such a devastating impact globally. But it was far worse for people who are living in informal settlements because they were already living in such cramped area that Social distancing was impossible. But to make matters worse, you know, they didn't have access to even safe sanitation. And using a community toilet used to be such an ordeal for them. They were so scared. And to make things even more complicated, there were so many rumors making the rounds regarding COVID appropriate behavior and vaccination. The cities absolutely were clueless about how to track and monitor COVID patients in slums because they had no means of reaching out to them. I remember getting phone calls from several officers asking us, can we use the spatial data to track and monitor the patients? Luckily, just a year before the pandemic broke out, we had partnered with Google to try out digital addressing, which we uh, experimented in a couple of settlements in Pune. The whole idea was that if you and I use Google Maps, don't we, on a day-to-day -day basis to reach a place. So if we could give digital addresses to every house, which was nav navigable on, on Google Maps, then you could reach the doorstep of that family. And communities could leverage it for all kinds of online services, not just Amazon and Swiggy, but even get things like you know an LPG cylinder delivered at their doorstep, or postal services delivered at the doorstep, or emergency services like an ambulance or fire engine or whatever. And we thought from the government's point of it, it would make ample sense and it would be a great governance tool for them if they could precisely reach the location where there was an issue. From, uh, for example, if there was a manhole, you know, which needed to be attended to because it was overflowing, or a pan which was broken in one of the community toilet blocks, so that would be a great governance tool for them too. During the pandemic, it came as a boon. Because when the Kolhapur Municipal Corporation called up and said, 
please, please help us with our vaccination camps because we're just not getting a response from informal settlements. They refuse to get vaccinated. So we actually went about giving a digital address to every house in every settlement of Kolhapur, along with awareness campaigns around COVID. And the vaccination camps were so successful that over 75% of the people got vaccinated. And the ones who were left out, <laughs> the ones who were left out, we listed them out with their digital address, which is the plus code. And we submitted this list to the local ward uh, health officer who could then reach out at their doorstep and make sure that the people who got left out got vaccinated. So to, to date, we have actually uh, provided digital addressing to 68,000 families, but I personally feel that this needs to become a movement and taken across pan-India because you must incorporate this. This should get institutionalized in governance because there's no way you can otherwise govern and reach out with services where they're missing. This brings me to my third focus area, which is social housing. All of us know that land is a very precious resource. It has to be used very, very carefully and very, very uh, optimally. My worry is that because cities have been embarking on extremely ambitious housing programs, social housing programs, where especially in the large cities, suddenly, you know, communities are getting transported into very high-rise kind of development we may have a very big problem at hand in the days to come because what we might have to face is vertical slums which would be a far greater challenge than anything else. It's important that cities invest in gathering data about their communities and very, very good data sets because they must capture the lifestyles of the people, their aspirations, and they must get a birds and a worms eye view for this so that they can then you know, look at housing holistically in a context and make sure that they come out with solutions which will be sustainable in the years to come. We started our housing uh, efforts in year 96-97. And right from the word go, we involved communities completely in the process, not just in the design process, but even in the execution. So they felt, you know, very closely bonded with that house that was coming up, which was going to be theirs. And people have continued to live in those houses. What we have not compromised at all in any of the projects that we have done so far is light and ventilation. I think these are absolutely not compromisable. A recent study in the city of Mumbai has shown that incidence of tuberculosis is extremely high in uh, informal settlements as compared to the rest of the city it's for the simple reason that often in I'm sure all of you have gone to communities at some point. Many of them share three walls. And the amount of light and ventilation that comes in from just one wall is so inadequate because they're off very, very narrow lanes. So most of the time, they require 24 by 7 electricity. So today, I uh, am very happy to share that uh, we are actually doing a project in Kolhapur under the Prime Minister's Avas Yojana. Uh, with a settlement which is on the edge of the city. It's a small settlement, but it, there's an entire redevelopment which is happening where people have agreed to share land. They've registered themselves into a cooperative society with our help. They not only went through the design process, they even selected their contractor, and now they're monitoring and supervising their construction. So the, as you see, this pro project is already coming up. People are very happy. They're hoping that in another few months, they will be moving into their new houses. So to sum it up, I would like to say that data is an extremely powerful tool when it is co-created with stakeholders. It can bring in clarity, comfort, and confidence. It actually then helps you make informed decisions, which can then address the issues are, that are at hand. And then collectively, you come out with solutions which are win-win, and which are sustainable, and which ensure that you leave nobody behind. So I would like to urge all of you that we must collectively strive towards, you know, transforming informal settlements into healthy habitats. Thank you so much.
प्रोफेसर एस वेंकटरामनेया गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू इफ यू आर अ गेस्ट एट गॉड्स प्लेस व्हाट डू यू एक्सपेक्ट दैट्स व्हाट इज गोइंग टू बी द फोकस ऑफ नेक्स्ट 10 मिनट्स दिस इज द केस ऑफ एक्सेलेंस इन सर्विस डिलीवरी एट नन अदर देन वर्ल्ड्स लार्जेस्ट religious organization and the temple which is called balaji temple and uh, i've been visiting this temple right from my childhood as young as one year old and today i am turned 58 the kind of changes that i have seen in this organization is amazing at a premier institution like iim i developed a passion of conveying what is the things that is happening what are the things that are happening at this organization so along with my guru as a professor at iim ahmedabad and he happened to be my ex boss at iim indore we thought of writing a book highlighting the various aspects management aspects of this temple so that's what is the story of uh, this and um, i got motivated due to several reasons and this is one of the richest temples of the world and which attracts more than a lakh people every day and uh, it is 365 days a year there is no day where there was no flow of pilgrims except during covid time even god was not exempted from this crisis of covid so that's what you could see and this organization has a budget of uh, 4000 plus crores which is almost like uh, a health budget of any other state or something like that so we have seen the laddu and i was supposed to bring laddu for this conference but i could not manage it due to supply chain issues so ne- nearly about 5 to 6 lakh laddus have been made today which was increased from few thousands or few hundred uh, lakhs uh, uh, laddus to several laddus and people can buy any number of laddus online as well so as simple as uh, amount of water at uh, seven hills at a altitude of uh, several thousand feet providing 43 lakh gallons of water was a nightmare for this organization and none other than uh, one of the premier institu- uh, organizations in the country is uh, responsible for this and if you see this slide and there are lot of these numbers you name any number it is a big number and uh, dr sagar used to tell anything that you want to do change start with aims that is because the largest in the center and uh, similarly if you want to attempt anything on the other side in terms of pilgrimage etc it is the tirupati balaji temple which can attempt to change those things and these are the some of the things and from human hair one incident i can tell you so lord balaji earns a crore every day and he spends several crores as well so just to summarize the volume of operations is a big challenge and if you see the flow of this pilgrims at this place when you look at your hospital it is the flow of patients if you go to temple like this you will find a pilgrim everywhere and if you want to identify someone with you know clean shaved head everybody is clean shaved it's very difficult to identify even your google and other face map, uh, face recognition techniques will fail several times so one of the biggest difficulties here is unpredictability in the flow suppose you want to go to uh, place a from place b depending on your mood you can change so for the organization like tirupati balaji temple it's next to impossible to predict what is going to be the demand at a given place at a given point in time so that was the biggest challenge and these challenges have been addressed very meticulously by using technology as well as the posturing the innovation in house and many organizations very important observation here is that in many organizations you have a qualified mbas or engineers and doctors and science etc etc whereas in this organization the highest qualified is degree and many of them also with due respect i must tell you joined the organization under compassionate ground 
So making them to live up to that level is very difficult. The qualification skill levels of these people is very, very difficult. There are nearly 25,000 employees are working in this organization and um, nearly 15,000 people as on date are on outsourced and this organization has mastered how to outsource, how to improve the efficiency of the uh, operations in all its uh, uh, activities. You name Ladu making, it is outsourced. You name security to a large extent, it is outsourced. It is a traffic management, is a nightmare and a small place. And all technologies that you could see, today electric vehicles we are talking about, which is happening, the starting point is, it's like a, ISRO is launching vehicles and similarly electric vehicles will also launch at Tirupati Balaji temple. It is a, one way or the other, it is a platform for experimenting several things due to this lot of stakeholders. Everybody who visit this temple or organization, everybody becomes expert and they start giving uh, advices. As a result of that, the organization also very responsive and they started uh, putting voice of customer. Voice of customer is one of the best mechanisms that this organization is following. So I'll show you a few things and uh, some of the services that they offered. There are many services. Some of the landmark services that you can see is uh, transport. When you go there, your luggage has been handled very safely, like in an airport. In an airport, uh, airlines also, you reach one place and your, your luggage can still reach another place if you are not lucky. Whereas here, you, they know or either you can get a, a slip saying that what is the, uh, you know, cabin number of your luggage when you go up hills, from down hills to up hills and that receipt number will be given or at least like a cupboard number or a, is a to, cha, mm, this locker number will be given to you and you go with that digital card and they will see you and they will verify your card and they will give back your luggage and so on and so forth. That is one side. On the other side, if you see the responsiveness of this organization in terms of responding to the needs of the uh, visiting pilgrims or uh, changing with the times, the change management is very, very continuous and uh, this organization adapt very uh, uh, well, very robust, agile organization I can say over the periods pre-independence to till date, lot of amendments acts. There is a separate act called the TTD Act which comes under uh, government of Andhra Pradesh. Though it is uh, under the control of government, but the IAS officer and the contingent of IAS officers who are responsible for this. And one side there is a uh, uh, government uh, rules and the other side is a religious organization. So there are a lot of such obligations for these uh, leaders that need to be managed and there are a lot of trade-offs that needs to be engaged. and. Uh, even for the state government, it is a big challenge because it comes with the criticism. And you will find lot of initiatives that has been taken. For example, luggage handling system. The moment you hand over anything in the open bags also, this organization handles uh, that luggage also very safely and secured. And uh, other thing is Ladu. In the also copying is uh, very rampant in this country or anywhere else also because the lakhs of Ladus have been made in that place. When you go out uh, in any other city also, there are few cities where they started selling Tirupati Laddu in the name of Tirupati Laddu. Even Laddu copying is not spared in this country, I am sorry to say. So they have to uh, certify that it is a GI certified and you will see that GI certification is being done by one of the, none other than the premier uh, or other organization and uh, uh, very prestigious uh, uh, legal expert was involved in uh, making this happening. And from that time onwards, even Balaji Ladu is protected. So even Balaji is not spared from copying in its uh, Ladu production. And uh, another very big challenge was uh, in, uh, uh, induction of uh, uh, female transurers. Suppose if a lady uh, pilgrim goes to a temple, they want to offer their uh, uh, hair due to n number of uh, religious woes, etc. She will be comfortable if a lady uh, transurer uh, serves her. So as a result of that, you can see these kind of things also is the world's uh, uh, breakthrough uh, uh, initiative that uh, uh, female transurers have been inducted into the uh, uh, contingent. There are more than 1500 transurers who are working round the clock 24-7. There is no non-stop. There are a lot of services which are non-stop. 
except lord balaji who sleeps for about 2 to 3 hours mandatory sleep otherwise we may be thinking that doctors are all working 24/7 and all even lord balaji is working because he has borrowed lot of money so he has to repay so that is the on the lighter side of the note that he has borrowed lot of money so he has to repay that money to all this uh, you know uh, low uh, lender yes and uh, lot of prices earlier there were lot of changes that, uh, if you are a free uh, free uh, ticket uh, 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 pilgrim you will have to have uh, some laddu and if you are a paid customer it is a different laddu in recent past there has been normalized everybody gets a laddu and it is like when you go to lord balaji he treats you with a, a sweet uh, called uh, laddu which is his favorite so that's what and the laddu pricing is also been rationalized at time to time all these kind of decisions have been taken care uh, with the management interventions and if you see la digital transformation people talking about digital 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 i am happy to see atyusha i am also talking about uh, uh, this digital google and all and uh, this organization is well known for its uh, digital transformation everything if you visit today and uh, to a large extent your uh, recommendations will not work there only it will work there so to that extent uh, the it has been deployed and apart from this this organization is also takes care of a lot of things health education uh, you know uh, child care home, uh, old age homes etc a so lot of such kind of uh, 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 welfare schemes are also been uh, employed and uh, also the temples who have been constructed i think uh, uh, other parts of the country you might have seen jammu and other parts of the uh, city and uh, other parts of india as well as outside india also uh, these uh, temples have been constructed to spread the uh, lot of social activities as well as religious activities and uh, health care and hygiene if you go to tirupati balaji temple when you walk without uh, shoes or sandal you will find now you are walking in the inside your home it's almost like that the such kind of uh, hygiene has been maintained and uh, there is also a notice board if you happen to see or if you to feel that there is any uh, odor in in the uh, air you can still complain not about the dust on the road even if you happen to experience any bad smell you can still complain to the health officer at at that point in time so the green apart from this that there are also a lot of green practices that has been followed and uh, including uh, banning of uh, plastics and uh, plastic bottles etc today that is the biggest uh, uh, challenge for every organization this organization also faces and for your information i was talking to a, a water supply company packaged water supply company as ban as a result of this ban their sales have increased which was a very counterintuitive this is what is evidence based uh, father rather and the, now the water is been supplied in glass bottles and the consumption has increased for the company and the company started making more money than earlier this is what is the reality okay so and also the solar and wind energy is also been uh, in a very big way they are shifting like uh, towards net zero you talk about all these corporate planning corporate practices you will see those practices following uh, followed at this organization so some of the transformational challenges uh, that you can think of is uh, luggage handling system that i mentioned the laddu production uh, the and its pricing and the induction of female tonsurers deployment of it ict at uh, yeah ict at uh, uh, throughout the organization and 24/7 call center you can call even now you can verify some of you want interested you please verify that and uh, the goshala charitable trust and the uh, pricing of laddus and um, many such uh, decisions have been taken at uh, at this organization now i will just want to ask you one thing when you go to airport if there are more crowd more more passengers and there will be a multiple counters that can be opened if you are if the same thing if you are the in charge of tirupati balaji temple and there are more number of people let us say all of a sudden there is a influx of uh, uh, people let us say all of a sudden on weekend 1 lakh plus people have come what will you do what is that you can do if there is more patients at your uh, emergency care what are you going to do you may say that i will deploy another uh, three more doctors or two more doctors or junior resident senior resident but there is only one balaji what will you do everybody wants to see the same balaji right how can you do this so this organization is not only responsible for this kind of things they also used mathematical models this is for your information my dear friend and this is a 
like in a in, a, in normal system system supply will be multiplied multiple times that is what is multi channel queuing system whereas here balaji is single and the other side the the pilgrims have to be segregated into streamlines there is what I, I i published a paper also on that it is a three channel queuing model where the demand is channelized into three channels very simple common sense solution there is like a step here one step and there is a, is a slant also the slope the first round is uh, lower next round is a little higher next one is a little higher and it will be a, like a u curve it is a three channel and per hour today we can make 15000 people to get darshan per hour per minute 15000 people and this was the common uh, common uh, sense solution along with my uh, senior person who was happened to be the ias officer there we said even in the small temples you will find this big temple you have to do this so that uh, that helped me to publish a paper and as a result of that i also got my incentive in the name of lord balaji <laughs> he paid my bill <laughs> All right so like that there are a lot of uh, the, the biggest pain for them is a vip darshan like any other uh, hospital system also when there is a vip all other common passenger common pilgrims or uh, common patients have to be stopped at the cost of them here also there are a lot of such uh, revisions uh, to the uh, segregating their right sizing of the capacity precisely what they are doing is they are allocating all these things in a much better way time to time based on the all these things so what is that we can learn at the end of the day here it is a continuously changing organization which evolved over a period of time i myself can see a lot of such changes and um, so it is time to time it is uh, changing itself and uh, the formal informal posturing of creativity and change management to large volume of operations not uh, one day or two days it is every day business so that is the biggest uh, thing and the best practices related to the managing uh, multiple stakeholders like as what you have seen in other social project etc etc here the number of stakeholders are unlimited rather so everybody is a stakeholder who they, those who are sitting and watching a tv is also a stakeholder and it has a two uh, the transponders uh, uh, tv channel and of, of course it has been transformed by my, none other than my own student from iim okay so there are a lot of constraints and uh, the leader has to manage and you can see everybody in this organization they feel that they live pride like uh, emergency medicine uh, leaders and everyone who is managing this kind of crowd their confidence levels you have to see my dear and there is also a training institute and how to handle these people and the employees of this organization have been continuously trained on how to handle the pilgrims when they are at your home it's like you are guest at lords none other than lords place so that is the mechanism that they follow and the best practices in funds management in fact lord balaji also has a demat account how many of you have demat account lord balaji also have a demat account his funds have been very well managed and they he has a tons of gold and that gold is being deposited in the banks and banks you name any bank that bank is present in the present in atirupati balaji temple so the best funds management and in fact i am trying to register for my second phd on funds management in this organization this for you i already committed i am committing again so that i cannot escape that is the reason so uh, this uh, uh, piloting and management organization transformation is a very uh, big lesson that we can learn and uh, experience in managing multiple verticals and uh, administrative uh, challenges is plenty so to put it in nutshell that this organization is one of the most transparent you will find every every decision that has been taken you will find on website even today you can go back and trace all those uh, things also and transparency is uh, one uh, big uh, thing and uh, uh, framework for prioritizing activities like uh, pilgrims versus social activities and so on and so forth and excellence in managing large scale operations you name annaprasadam nearly about 70000 people are fed every day 70000 people and uh, much more than that is also fed outside and uh, you you look at the queue as i told you instead of you know you can't uh, duplicate balaji but you can address at the other way around right and uh, the ladoo production transport luggage 
and uh, accommodation. It is a 7,600 plus rooms which can accommodate nearly 40, 50,000 people and it is a nightmare for them. Yes. So, housekeeping and parka money. Accounting of money itself is the big uh, issue for this organization. And uh, social harmony and uh, peace. As you could see, there is no untoward incidents happening there. And excellence in subcontracting. You name uh, subcontracting, the entire world is moved towards uh, subcontracting. You can see this subcontracting, the way it has been handled is excellent. I can tell you, I am also on the committee of uh, e-procurement there. And uh, sugar, which was purchased at a rate of uh, 46 rupee per kg at one point in time after e-procurement and policy change, and it is brought down. Can you imagine how much? 27 rupees. From 47 rupees to 27 rupees. This is what is the the game of the the, the name of the game is is you, you increase the volume. You think that you can reduce the price. No, your dependency on your supplier becomes very high. So, as a result of that, unless you change your policy, you, nothing can happen. So, what we suggested was uh, myself and my guru from IAM Bangalore, we suggested a few mechanisms for their procurement. As a result of that, from three suppliers to 30 suppliers, and it is a really a big fight for them, and only competition can drive the price. Only competition can contain the prices. So, the competition among the suppliers, the fight between them, has made these prices to slash down. It is not the high volume demand that makes your, brings down your cost. Rather, it is the supply side competition that brings down the cost. That is the one big management lesson. I think my sessions also in my MBA course is a star because of this kind of uh, evidences. So, adoption of uh, uh, digital technologies and transformation from religious organization to social organization. If you visit that website, you will find how it has been transformed into a such a organization. With this, I will stop here unless if there is any question. In the name of so next time when you are a guest at Lord Balaji's uh, home, you can see many of these things. I wish you all good luck. Thank you. Dr. Patanjali Dev Nair. Doctor, Doctor, Jaldi Aye, Dekhi Kya Hora, Doctor, Are Doctor Kya? Doctor, 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 Dekhi Re Kya Hora, Are Bhai, Kya Hora, Shout Kar Raha? Dusra Marij Bhi To Dekhna Mere Ko, Kya Baat Hai? Or Ye Ye Chadar Me Kya Laya Hai Inko? Doctor, Stature Hi Nahi Hai. कि क्या करते हैं लेके देखो ना अरे ये तो मर गए जल्दी नहीं ला सकते थे इतनी देर से लाए हो बड़े बूढ़ो का ख्याल नहीं करते हो खुश ख्याल नहीं करते बड़े बूढ़ो का ये ले आते हो हमारे पास मर गए ले जाओ लाश को डॉक्टर साहब अरे डॉक्टर साहब अब अभी तो सांस चल रही थी अभी तो देख उठा के अभी तो सांस चल रही थी इनकी फिर से देख लीजिए ना डॉक्टर मैं हूं कि तुम कितनी पढ़ाई करने के बाद गोल्ड मेडल लेने के बाद डॉक्टर बना तुम कहते हो फिर से देखो ले लो लाश को हे वाज दिस डॉक्टर गोल्ड मेडलिस्ट हार्ड वर्किंग कंसेंशियस वेरी डेडिकेटेड टू द जॉब but possibly not very sensitive. He wasn't trained in grief management. Didn't know that his utterances, words will have an impact on the family. So he did this. Who was this doctor? Happened many times. This conscientious gold medalist doctor? Yours truly, me. Yes, and many like me. You see a nice, good-looking man, 
let me compliment my own self <laughs> standing in front of you but talking about instances nearly 40 years ago still remembers them why did they happen for that you will have to understand the casualty of those days the department small room and the patients please join me let's see my casualty are ek hi stretcher hai khoon laga hua saaf nahi kiya tumne aur iski gaddi phati hui hai are iska wheel nahi hai ek kahan chala gaya sir wo ramesh ne apni jeb mein rakh liya hai nahi to log casualty se le jate hain stretcher ko sister ji zara oxygen chala ke dikhaiye knob ghumaiye is pe to oxygen hi nahi hai एक और सिलेंडर लाइए डॉक्टर साहब अब तो सिलेंडर मिलना मुश्किल है शाम के टाइम सेक्शन मशीन का प्लग कम गया डॉक्टर साहब वो स्मैकिए आते हैं ले जाते हैं दो रुपए में बेच देते हैं वट यू डू व्हील चेयर अरे इसका फुटरेस्ट नहीं है मरीज आएगा तो लोग और चोट लगेगी डॉक्टर साहब बहुत बारी कंप्लेन कर चुके हैं व्हील मिलती नहीं है सो दैट्स माई कैजुअलिटी मैं नहीं हो जिस वॉन्ट यू गेट द सेंस ऑफ इट कम आउट विद मी लेट्स सी द पेशेंट्स बहना क्या हुआ तुम्हारे को डॉक्टर साहब चार महीने का गर्भ था सुबह से ब्लीडिंग हो रही है अब तो बहुत दर्द हो रहा है लग रहा है कुछ बाहर आ रहा है डॉक्टर साहब अरे ये तो कंपाउंड फ्रैक्चर है क्या हो गया भाई डॉक्टर साहब सड़क पे जा रहा था एक गाड़ी वाला मार गया साला भाग भी गया मैं खुद ये साइकिल वाले मुझे लेके आए यहाँ अरे सत्तू इसको जल्दी अंदर लेके जाओ इसका काम शुरू कराओ बच्चा डॉक्टर साहब देखो ना इसकी सांस चल रही है बहुत ज्यादा क्या हुआ बहना इसको डॉक्टर साहब प्राइवेट में गए थे वो बोले इसको निमोनिया है बड़े अस्पताल ले जाओ मैं आपके पास आई हूँ कुछ करो ना इसका जल्दी क्या बात सुबह से दिल में दर्द हो रहा है द मैन इज स्वेटिंग बैडली अरे सर तू इनको जल्दी लेके जाओ ये वो मेडिसिन को बुलाओ डॉक्टर साहब ये जो लड़की है नींद की गोलियां खा ली नंबर अच्छे नहीं आए थे पूरी बोतल खा ली इसने कुछ तो करी है डॉक्टर साहब अरे नहीं डॉक्टर साहब डॉक्टर साहब पहले मेरा डॉक्टर साहब मेरा मरीज देखिए मेरा मरीज देखिए ऑल एट वन टाइम साइमल्टेनियसली इज नॉट एन एग्जेजरेशन I didn't know the word triage, but I was triaging by going out and choosing the more severe emergencies out of all the emergencies. So now the next question again: Why? Why did it happen? The various specialities of the hospital were located at various corners: ICU here, CCU here, medicine man here. Labor room this side, scattered. So what you had was a totally non-organized, non-integrated, fussy Paris process-oriented system, and not patient-oriented. There was no orientation. The patient was not in the center. It was the process, and that is what was happening about that the physicians from their own um conveniences had spread out i once remember taking a 8 year old girl i still remember her weight running to the icu which was around 200 yards away i'm not very athletic but in those days i was a bit so i ran with the child and i got smashed shouted upon by the icu doctor how dare you bring a patient you cmo we will choose who comes to the icu not you that was the issue it's happening we felt sad you can see even today i can feel about it but we dreamed we started dreaming ajay and others we started dreaming of having a integrated trauma and emergency system 
everything it to be at one place, adequately staffed, adequately staffed, and with the instrumentation or the things which you require. So that was a dream. Started working for it. Met people from various other hospitals, including Ames. What changes can we bring? Slowly and steadily they started moving. But they were just tinkering. That was like a drop in the ocean. Reason was, it required a systemic reset, which was beyond the power of a casualty medical officer or even the MS of the hospital or others. It just required a systemic change. But we didn't stop dreaming. What does it mean by dreaming? It's not only Kalpana. It's working towards that Kalpana. I talked to many other people. There were many other doctors who felt similarly or even worse than me and they gave up the job, they moved away. They said, we can't work in such circumstances because it's leading to many of the deaths are preventable. And that's the whole point. That how can you allow a, you know, somebody to die when you know that you could have saved him or her very well. So he kept on moving. We talked to others. We read journals, we wrote articles. We went and met ministers. I had approach in those days. But then things didn't move much. So, suddenly, as you say, Lord Krishna, Balaji, came to the aid. And lo and behold, the World Health Organization, WHO, asked me, would you like to join us? The WHO, World Health Organization, Southeast Asia Regional Office. Yes, they asked me. I didn't go to them. I said, yes, of course, I'd like to join you. So I joined WHO. I get posted in Delhi, Manila, Maldives, back to Delhi. And quickly enough, I made the regional advisor for the 11 countries of the region for disability and injury prevention. Injury, that's what is coming to the casualty areas. So suddenly you got a chance to fulfill the dream which you thought about fulfilling by talking about and making the trauma and emergencies integrated together. So this is a big opportunity. Opportunities come disguised. They come disguised as problems. They come disguised as obstacles. But most of all, they come disguised as challenges. The first challenge we faced was the concept itself. Trauma ko emergency? Hey, alag alag hai. Main trauma surgeon ho. Kya baat karte hai? Diarrhea dekhunga. Janani ki bleeding dekhunga. Nahi. Bache ko dekhunga. Hey, na pediatric. Wahan leke jao. So to sell the idea, to make people buy in itself, was the biggest challenge. Surprisingly, you know, today's people, you may think. What is he talking about? But exactly, to break people's mindset that life is, that we deal with a life, not with a speciality. It took time. How so simple, but when you start talking about how so complex and how so difficult, it seems is to sell the idea that we are all working to save lives, whichever way possible. But no, I will work only in orthopedics. My work is fracture. Anyway, so we moved wrong. And then I met people like Bhoi, Sagar. Should take names, should take not. I don't know, but I cannot resist what's coming at this mind is that we had a meeting. Three people, Bhoi, Tej Prakash, Sagar was assisting us from distance. Four hours meeting at one time, no tea, no water. Wrote down on a whiteboard on the side things required to bring this integration for us. Everything got worked out on a whiteboard. There and then. And the first thing that came out was to have a regional strategy integrating trauma and emergency services. That came up after a couple of years. We had a very nice, very simple, that's why it sold. The next was, challenge was to sell it to the government that you need trauma services, ki hai, 
ट्रॉमा सेंटर्स की नहीं आपको लोगों को सर्विसेज देनी है ना कि रोड ट्रैफिक क्रैश होता है आपको उनको जल्दी से जल्दी सर्विसेज दिलवानी है कि एक बड़ी बिल्डिंग में लेके जाना है उच्च बिल्डिंग में लेके जाना है कि वो ट्रॉमा सेंटर है नहीं पहुंच पाएंगे वहां हमारे यहाँ एम्बुलेंसेज से पचास किलोमीटर दूर लकीली सम ऑफ द गुड ऑफिसर्स इन गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इन सम ऑफ द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट्स वर एबल टू सी दैट आइडिया दैट इज येस इट मेक सेंस इट डज मेक सेंस इट स्टार्ट एंड देन इट लेट टू लॉ ऑफ थिंग्स सो दैट दैट वी कीप ड्रीमिंग इन ट्वेंटी ईयर्स लेटर आई मीट पीपल इन द चांस कम्स एज इफ दे आर वर्किंग फॉर मी आई थॉट सागर इज वर्किंग फॉर मी दैट्स एग्जैक्टली द फीलिंग आई हैड एंड टिल हैव टूडे दैट इज माई ड्रीम फॉर विच यू ऑल आर वर्किंग फॉर and came up now the government of india that by 2023 all medical colleges have to have we can say medicine as a subject it opened up so it came up in the kind of things and then as i said it comes as challenges and as problems but you need advocates you need networking you need people to join you you have to have a group you can't do it alone so how does that happen that happens when people see your continuing passion when they see you are dedicated when they see you have a plan when they see that you have clarity when they see that you are able to do it when they see the data that you have already done it in some of the places you show it to them all these steps take time so how do you do this you think big bigger keep on thinking big what we had today for the sessions think big never dilute your thinking your aspiration your your imagination your dream was that the starting point you will have lot of resistance you will have people telling you to pagal hai you think it can happen in india can you do this moji can you do it in arunachal they laugh let them first they laugh second they ridicule then they join you gandhi said it long time ago many people said it earlier in different words so they joined me because i kept on persisting this few minutes which i am taking is not to talk about me is to talk about the process how it got done exactly the way the groups so i represent that group here not me alone maybe the dream started with me but all of these people were also dreaming they are still dreaming of many new things to come and they'll come so think big bigger biggest your choice but then start small small bites how to eat an elephant bit by bit this was an elephant so bit by bit you start and another advantage of starting small is that the small victories pat on the back they train you for bigger things to come add it together all those small victories actually become a stepping stone for the next bigger victory never mind never believe that things have to be done all at once you do them small you do start them they keep on adding on but what it means is persist start small doesn't mean you stop start small means continue keep on doing because you need a different kind of allies now earlier i had allies from jp apex from a center indosem today i needed allies in the state governments in the central government the health ministers everywhere else so the tricks which worked in the beginning are not not necessarily the ones which will work now you need a different skill set keep on building that skill set learn from others talk to people listen the biggest thing you all can do we all can do is listen and you can gain so much you gain trust of the people once you listen to them and tell them yes i think it is valuable let's add this or say i don't think uh, this scheme of thing will work 
but thank you very much for your valuable advice. Both are acceptable, but listen. So that comes on start small. The third, there are only three points I have. The rest of the 10 minutes was, the drama was to come to this. Why it is needed? And the third one is, act now. There's never going to be a better time than today, and in today, this moment. You got to act now. Don't wait, oh, when the MS badlenge, tab mein kaam karunga. Ya, ya, health minister theek nahi hai. He is what, he or she is the best you have got today. Because you may not be there tomorrow. What guarantee do I have that I am there in tomorrow in front of you? No guarantee. So act now. What does it mean? Keep on advocating. Keep on advertising. Keep on asking. Don't stop in asking. You won't get it the first time. People have said, we'll call you fool. Call you, hey, sara din ek hi baat karta hai. Ye to broken record, phata rewa record hai. Ek hi baat bolte rehta hai Patanjali. Absolutely fine. I think that's the biggest compliment I got is that I'm a broken record because that's the technique I use. I want to continue talking about it. I chose this topic even for this August gathering because that's something which we require today. Integrated trauma and emergency service everywhere. And they can be done and they have been done. What we require now is to increase the pace and do that. So act now. Think big, start small, act now. Simple. Is it that simple? Actually speaking, it is. It just takes time. For a nuclear explosion, for a critical mass to explode at the same time. But that reaching that critical mass for a nuclear explosion may take a split second or a second. It takes a little time. So for integrating emergency services to reach that critical mass of people who think alike and who want to do it, take some time. That is, we are building critical mass. The explosion is still by it's pretty simple. It will happen. My job is to build the mass and I'm here to build the mass. All of you, are, we are all together to build that mass and we'll do it. It can be done very simply and astonishingly quickly, if you don't mind, who gets the credit? As soon as I want to take the credit, I'll have a problem. If you have no problem with somebody else getting the credit, you will be astonished by the results you get. And that's not me who's saying it. It was the 33rd president of USA, Harry S. Truman, who said it. It is as true today as it was true in the Truman's days. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Tanushka Manzukhani Melwani. Good morning. And uh, after Patanjali sir's talk, I feel like this is just a great segue. I would like each of you to look at each other, someone on your right, someone on your left, because they might make an absolute split second decision today that will change your life. But it gets worse. That person could also be you. Now I'm here today to talk about communication and yes, those split second decisions that you doctors make can be the difference between life and death for your patients. 
but I want to let you know that it also has a profound effect on your loved ones, near and far, generationally I might add. This brings me to that event, the passing of my father in an ER halfway across the world when I had barely entered my double digits. This one event was a split second event that took away not only my father, but it also took away my safety net, my biggest cheerleader, and even a huge significant part of myself. This one event, unknown to me at the time, would shape the young woman, the wife and mother that I would become. My communication pattern was set. This brings me to a concept that I have been intrigued by, which is the butterfly effect. The chaos theory states that even the tiniest change in one place can give rise to massive consequences in seemingly unrelated environments. Just like the flapping of a mere butterfly's wings can set off a hurricane halfway across the world, similarly one action or choice can ripple through our lives and the lives of others. To illustrate this fact, I want you to consider this astonishing statistic that I actually chanced upon when I was researching emergency medicine physicians. And the Times of India in 2019 said that uh, the Mumbai public hospitals handled about 3,000 ER cases daily. Now, I did some quick math and I scaled it annually and you have a million cases handled in just one city alone. That's astounding in itself. But can you imagine how many million lives have been impacted beyond the ER? Right? So, this is the scale of event. One simple action and a million people can be impacted beyond the ER. Today, I want to take you on a journey, but this would require a confession on my part. So, in about 25 years ago, I made a split second decision. And this was on a rainy July afternoon, and I made the decision to enroll in dentistry school. This decision not only impacted my life, it impacted those around me, as well as people I hadn't even yet met. This single decision in my life led to events that would follow. So after this, I want to let you know. I am sorry, I don't have my clicker with me. Sorry. Clicker. Yes. So joining dentistry school was that one pivotal moment that changed everything in my life. Moving on, after that, it came to um, this, this um, I want to bring to your attention, this is the scene that happens when an unrelated environment such as the wheeling of an ER, you know, in the ER situation there was a, sorry, I just need a moment, sorry, I'm so sorry, so sorry about this. I'll just start again from Today I want to share and take you on a journey. 25 years ago, I made the decision that would not only impact my life, but lives of people around me and even people that I was not related to. I made a decision in a split second to join and enroll in dentistry school. Actually, I went to D.Y. Patil Dental College 25 years ago. This one decision would change my life in ways that I would not even expect. It brings me to the butterfly effect where one event leads to another. I, all of you will remember a time when there was a prominent leader from Thane City that was wheeled into the ER of a prestigious hospital. Now what followed after he was proclaimed dead was a picture of chaos and insanity that had far-reaching effects, not only on society at large, but even on the immediate stakeholders, right? As a 
conscious communication coach, I would like to tell you that that physical breakdown and the split second decisions that led to that physical breakdown was actually a fundamental and complete breakdown in communication. So let's go down to the art of split second decisions and unravel what it means to be making split second decisions. Split second decisions that are made, the 35,000 decisions that we all make today in our lives, 70 of them are split second and can be life changing. Right, so from these, I want to introduce to you the split second decisions that will change our lives. Let me introduce to you the five F's. Okay, so the first F is the fighter, fixer, fleer, fauna, and freezer. These are simple five F's that we have as our ingrained survival reactions when threat kicks in. But what is more amazing is the way they manifest through our ego directly influencing our communication style. So take for example the fighter. That fighter communicates with anger. He's the enforcer, he's the litigator, he's the critic. Now you take the fixer. They are the people pleasers, they are the over warriors, they are the, uh, you know, the, the over pleasers. Take for example now the fleer. The fleer just abandons, rejects and neglects. You have the fauna, takes the role of a diva and an attention seeker. And finally you have the freezer that will just avoid any decision or discussion making in the making. These roles are ingrained in all of us. The fighter, the fixer, the freezer, the fauna and the fleer ingrained in all of us. I'm so sorry. I, just, I would like to come again. I'm just very nervous. Sorry. So that decision to enroll in dentistry college was me being the fixer. As I people pleased my way until life gave me an opportunity to give it up altogether. I still remember the day, actually more the face, when I met the aspiring dental student who asked me, and told me that he didn't get the seat because someone like myself did. Reflecting on how many more split, split second decisions and this fixer mentality would allow other students to change their trajectory. Little did I know that that fixer pattern in me and that split second decision to enroll in dentistry college would result in me unknowingly giving my consent to people, places and things that I really didn't want. My head said no, my actions said yes. The voices in my head were like cross communication. It almost felt like my life was like a, cra a game of crashing dominoes. It felt like I really was holding up a lot. My life then came to an abrupt stop in the form of my personal rock bottom. Fast forward to 2018, my then nine year old son started acting out in school. You see, he was getting bullied, blamed and shamed. My husband and I were so helpless that we actually started living Einstein's definition of insanity. 
We just kept saying and doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. We even asked him to become like ourselves, just become the people pleaser, just please and please your classmates and your teacher and just fit in. I begged him, I pleaded him, just fit in to accommodate a schooling system that could not and would not understand him. As our communication broke down, so did our relationship with him. As we were not hearing and neither getting heard, it shows us that when we don't listen, we also don't get heard. Fast forward to this situation going out of hand, my husband and I fell into our own victim cycles. For me, what had I done to deserve this? What was I doing wrong? My husband had his own existential crisis. What kind of father am I? Why aren't we getting this right? Luckily, he didn't give up on us like those other relationships. And he made so much noise that he forced us to find a way to decode what was underlying the behavior. Similar to the iceberg, what you see on the tip is not what you see below. What lay beneath after we understood was an extremely scared, ashamed and vulnerable child. Here we thought we were raising a child. In turn, he was raising a conscious parent and communicator in us. As we learned to communicate consciously and get heard and listen to him, relationship to him and self was restored. Finally certified with the conscious parenting methodology, I now had unleashed a butterfly effect of my own, basically liberating millennials and the next gen, one person and one parent at a time. This story ends with all his acting out disappearing and everything returned to normal once we could enter once we could counter his environment this brings me to the point where when we it brings us to the it brings me to the point when if we can understand why we do what we do it will make a big difference in understanding and imagining a world where we understand each other without resorting to reactivity and it turns out that there is a way. We can navigate this conflict and interactions by using that roadmap, using conflict and using conscious communication. This is us from that child who you saw before. It was absolutely a meeting before he was about to be absolutely shamed by six people. Cut to this bright, beautiful, brilliant child. So as we stand at the crossroads of chaos and clarity where stand, as we stand at the crossroads of chaos and clarity, remember this, in the stormiest of decisions, every decision that you make is like a butterfly that's taking flight. It's flapping wings create a ripple effect. So in a profession like yours, where decisions are made in the blink of an eye, when your decisions, if you, the way you communicate can be the difference between, between uh, confusion and collaboration. It can be the difference between fear and reassurance and impacting a million lives. So as Mahatma Gandhi said, and I quote, in a gentle way, you can shake the world. It's time now. I invite each of you esteemed doctors and members of the audience to embrace and unleash your butterfly effect and make the split second decision to communicate consciously. Now you know that one is a million. Thank you. Namaste.
Dr. Vimal Krishnan Pillai. I'll start with the story of my marriage. A lot of people know me here. A lot of people know the story of my marriage. But for the others who don't know that, I'll be very brief. So on the day of my marriage, on the evening of the day of my marriage, the wedding, we had a reception. I was there on stage. My wife was besides me. My uncle came on and collapsed. Unfortunately, the cameraman collapsed too, seeing this. My instincts kicked in. I jumped on, started doing CPR on him. My wife was there, helping me out. My friends, some of them here, uh, half an hour late for the marriage, Indian standard time. They reached a little bit later. They walked to a hall, which is almost empty, because everybody is surrounding the stage and I'm doing CPR in, in the midst of it. Thankfully, they could hear my voice. One, two, three, 30 and two breaths going again. One, two, three, drenched in sweat. I'm continuing with CPR. Like I said, the cameraman collapsed. I don't have it uh, on, a, on a feed, on a digital print. But the whole thing was seen by all those people there. My friends joined in. We had a defibrillator on the hall. We defibrillated him thrice on stage and a fourth time on route to the ambulance. We had an ALS ambulance coming in because somebody had called in an ambulance. We, I placed off an IV line. I gave him the first shot of adrenaline on stage. I even walked to the ambulance with my friends together. We flocked into the ambulance. I walked into the ambulance, stepped inside. That's when my friend tapped me and told me, dude, you got to get married. Move. So I moved back. Fortunately for me, Unfortunately for my wife, we've been married, it's been 10 years right now, and this is the photo of my wedding. Why did it happen is not the question that I, that I would want to ponder on. What we did and what happened next. He was taken, diagnosed to have a massive inferior wall MI. They got him stented, walked on to live another day. The story is, why is the story very important? Why am I wearing this? Because I wore this on that wedding day. On that evening, I was wearing this, doing all sorts of resuscitative measures on a patient who was very dear to me. What difference did we make? We worked well as a team. And that's the day when it struck me that one person can't make a difference. It needs a team to talk about it. Right, what Patanjali sir was talking about. You need to dream, but we need to dream together. It's not just one person's dream. So I started thinking about teams, about how we can train teams and went down to the basic question. What constitutes a team? So you brought up by teams, your mom, your dad, your folks at home, they worked as a team to bring you up. What constitutes a team? There are people who are big, small, who are playing forward, backward, right? There are umpteen parameters that would need to specifically call a group of human beings a team. We're very strategically placed as emergency physicians. I work in an emergency department day in, day out. Very strategically placed because I believe the emergency department is a doorway to the community. People walk in, walk out. We provide care 24-7, 365, no matter if it's Onam, Pongal, Sankranti, Christmas. You name the day, I've worked those days. I've worked the past 13 Onams inside the emergency department. Fortunately, this time again, when I'm looking at the duty road, I'm working and own them inside the department again as a professor in emergency medicine. The good part about working in emergency medicine is it, it makes you very humble. Because you don't just work with doctors, you don't just work with nurses, you work with people who go to the field and provide care on the field, our paramedics. We do a training program for bachelors and masters in, uh, in emergency medicine technology. People call it technician course, it's a technology course, mind you. 
we work with counselors, financial counselors and other counselors inside the hospital. We work with the administration every single day we work with police. Every single day we work with the judicial system where we come in with medical legal cases. We work with other depart uh, departments inside the hospital. And more importantly, emergency medicine has its flavor of its own. There are people who believe that emergency medicine can be taught by other broad specialties. When you remember that disaster medicine has got its own DNA and can be taught by emergency physicians. When you look into point of care of the sound, the guru is here. It can be taught by emergency physicians. It brings in a unique flavor for emergency medicine, which is much and starkly different from other flavors that you've seen and relished from your undergraduate days in medicine. So if you look at this very picture, I try to encompass things which are there, which includes global health, one white man's vision to go to a third world country to loot and plunder and still be cared for, for the malaria that he got in from Africa, for the diseases that he can catch in from a colonial land. So even global health for that matter, international medicine for that matter, feeds off emergency medicine. If you look at public health, who else is better placed than, to, than emergency physicians and emergency departments to take a look at what the community and how the community is suffering. COVID has done and dusted, it's been three years. We're still getting COVID cases down my, my institute. There are people who still turn swab positive. But our mindsets have changed. Have, have it? Has it? I don't know. The biggest challenge that we faced with COVID was that everybody took a back seat. And unfortunately or fortunately for us, we were at the front lines managing cases day in, day out again. I had a pregnant wife with my second pregnancy, our second pregnancy during the COVID uh, wave. And I've got a COVID baby. She's turning three this September 26th. The biggest challenge that we as emergency medicine physicians faced was that public health was relegated to only us. And the rest were in Zoom platforms and online meetings. What we did, however, was to build a team a formidable force with the hospital administration so that we can care for the best and then build in confidence for other stakeholders to come in and work with us as a team. The biggest challenge with human beings are that we are egoistic. We tend to work in silos and it's all about me, me and me. What do I gain from it? So when I did my, my, uh, my fellowship in medical education, they were, telling, they were talking about why film? What is in it for me? It's a big question that management gurus might throw when gets a road degree. When you pitch in something, you got to think about what is in it for them. Unfortunately or fortunately, it's kind of creeping into healthcare industry. I call it healthcare industry now, like the others. What is required for a team? There are umpteen things that make a team different. We've all been taught through resuscitation courses and we believe that that is what a team constitutes. We've all been taught about good communication skills, closed loop communication respecting each other when you're communicating, constructively intervening during a resuscitation, maintaining a tone and posture, or even verbal and non-verbal cues. We all know how to do that now. We've been taught about that now. But as we move deeper and deeper into the non-technical skills that you need to work as a fine team, we find out newer things, newer arenas which are worth exploring. For example, leadership. I wasn't taught to be a leader in school. I wasn't taught to be a leader in college. I learned leadership skills looking at mentors, looking at gurus, looking at figures who've been, who've been leaders in their own ways. Now it's imperative that we teach leadership skills to, to those young students. Like Boisa says, catch them young. Get them to be leaders of their own. Let's not just clone kids into what we, what we are envisaging. Let them bloom into bigger leaders of tomorrow. If you look into the decision-making skills that we have, my emergency medicine uh, colleagues here would agree. You are resuscitating a case, you are in the midst of intubating and somebody would pop in that ECG and ask you about what you want to talk about. Uh, what's your opinion on this ECG? Right in the midst of that resuscitation. I know everybody who's nodding the Indian head shake because we've got yes here, no here and we've got the Indian head shake. Right? And the emergency physicians here on the floor do agree that we multitask multiple things together. And in the midst of all those chaos, you would have that big brooding nurse who cares for that particular patient coming and telling you, I don't feel so good about that case. And probably that is the next one that's going to crash. So decision making in split second, multitasking at various levels inside priority areas of care, and more importantly, situational awareness. 
having a bird's eye view is important caring for one patient is important having a feel of what is happening on your floor about the input of patients about the output of patients and patients who are getting inside the hospital the situational awareness grows umpteen times when you have a VIP coming on the floor you have all the bigger consultants flocking together to take care of that very person fortunately or unfortunately it is something which we can cultivate over a longer period of time and emergency physicians need to have this culture of situational awareness and good communication skills if you want to manage the floor more importantly they need to know the difference between good managers and good leaders most of you guys are seeing good managers on the floor you need to elevate yourself to become better leaders and bigger leaders the leader that you wished to have not the leader that you've seen the framework that WHO gives you gives you a sneak peek about everything right from things that are happening on the field which you've seen those paramedics go on the field and take care of patients our thought process is relegated to hospitals we believe that once a patient is brought to the hospital you take care of the patient the patient gets better or gets for worse it's his fate or her fate inside the hospital I believe it's much more than that it's about setting processes in alignment so that they can all slip into becoming a big system it starts with work on the field and who are the team players on the field is it just the paramedics no you need to train the community create awareness amongst people in the community and who are the best people seated to do that you and me together emergency physicians going to the field and talking to them about stroke not just about the chest pain that Bollywood movies so glaringly used to show up in the 90s when the heroine walks when Simran walks to Raj Mr. Puri will have a heart attack right the glamorization of acute coronary syndromes have led to cardiologists having bigger buildings nothing against them but it's time that more and more community are aware to not just a heart related problem but the other emergencies that can happen on daily basis so on the field our role to build in a team of community responders not just people who can go to the field and provide care like our paramedics from there setting up a call center they are part of the team how many of us have thought about setting up a control or command center in your hospital there should be people who be controlled who should be trained to manage a control and command center who can take in calls talk to them com comfort them make make sure that this patient's brought inside the hospital i relate to one small incident in social media there is a gentleman called dr glockin flecken he uh, is a cancer survivor a very big comedian and an ophthalmologist he uh, has multiple handles not just in x but also in youtube um, he had a cardiac arrest and his wife was a person who was resuscitating fortunately uh, women are better resuscitationists than men i'm sorry for that <laughs> I, no women in the room because they multitask on a daily basis they multitask with family they multitask with work they multitask men more difficult huh? men who are children huh? every single day the bigger challenge is, what, is that his wife was extremely calm she was telling them come come to this place I am doing resuscitation in the northeast zone of the house I don't think I would have the spatial orientation to talk to paramedics to come to the northeast zone of my house come I don't know where my bedroom is in the first place is it in the northeast zone God knows so what what I would come to is the fact that we need to have trained responders who can talk to them in a calm manner and, and direct them in a calm manner to give, maintain optimum care on the field at that point in time so there is a lot of importance for training people on call come again to the hospital the triage system which is again exponentially being growing over the past few years how do you triage where to triage is there a physician embedded triage that is required for your system or is it just the nurses who are going to do the triage you've got to decide on that in your system train them as a team as a cohort and not just delegated to one nurse who is the senior most in the group coming to the hospital we need to break silos and work in groups the administration has to come together the policy makers have to come together in the hospital we need to work together to form policy practice guidelines not just look into standard operating protocols alone but policies you know to to make sure that optimal outcome is 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 uh, achieved now is there a lot of evidence for team training we have done some this is something that was done during the second wave of the pandemic in in the zoom era we were zooming a lot 
So I decided to take in an interprofessional team, a team comprising of young medical students, young nurses, nursing students, fine year nursing students. We had paramedic students in the final year coming in. We had respiratory therapists coming in. We had dentists coming in, dental students coming in. We got these people together in a room, in a big room, 80 plus students. We broke them into smaller breakout rooms. We forced them to work in a group. Fingers crossed, believing that they'd work together. Fortunately, at the end of four hours, you could look at the screen, at the end of four hours, I'm right, there, right down there in the bottom, we still have smiling faces with a lot of enthusiasm telling me that we loved working in a team. And this is the first time ever they were completing their education, be it medical, be it dental, resp allied health sciences, nursing. They were completing their education. And I found out the stark truth that we are not engaging them in team activities and training them in teams. And that is the need of the hour to do more team training in your institute, in my institute, in our institute together, so that we can have people who can synchronously work together for saving that very life. So what is the missing puzzle in India? The missing puzzle in India is that you, have, you travel 200 kilometers in India, you have people wearing a different attire, talking a different language, eating different food. You need to club these together. You've got to be considerate of the social and the cultural norms. Embrace the language of that area. Make sure that you regionalize these modules so that you can have teams coming together and learning together. There are no language barriers for all these allied health, nursing, and other brethren to come together and work with us doctors. Let's break the silos. Let's break the colonial mindset that we have, including language to an extent, which is forcing the others to stay one step behind and ask us to lead the way. Let's hold them together, hold our hands together, and work together to develop better simulation training modules for team training, specifically focused on the non-technical part of it. Mind you, when you talk about simulation in India, there's a lot of people who would focus on toys and technology. I believe healthcare simulation is much beyond toys and technology. It's a tryst between human beings, you, me, to working together towards one convergent goal of saving that one life. Can we work on that? Can we work on that so that even on the worst or the best day of your life, if something happens, you would have a team working together to help you save that life? And that is what we need to look for in the future. Team training using simulation. Thank you very much. Dr. Vivek Chauhan. Right, left. Good afternoon. Today I want to share a remarkable journey that started with a single goal, to save lives. This is a story of innovation, determination, and the power of technology in transforming healthcare. So let's dive in. I was working as a junior resident in medicine when a patient was rushed into the emergency room. He was fully drenched in sweat and was gasping for air. He had come all the way from a village 300 kilometers away seeking urgent medical attention. But by the time we could act, it was too late. We lost him. This patient, named Mr. X, lived in a small village of Himachal, away from any major medical facility. The previous night, he woke up gasping for air, experiencing the telltale signs of a heart attack. However, access to emergency transport and proper medical facilities was severely limited at that time. This was 20 years back. Mr. X patiently waited until morning before seeking help at the nearest PHC, the primary health center. To his disappointment, the PHC lacked the necessary equipment such as an ECG machine for an accurate diagnosis. 
He was then referred to the nearest CHC, the Community Health Center. But to his dismay, they also didn't have the ECG machine. Mr. X was subsequently referred to the nearest district hospital, where he had to endure long queues and chaos to get an appointment with the specialist doctor who ordered an ECG and diagnosed him with a heart attack. Heart attack. This is a disease where minute is muscle and muscle is life. It took him over 12 hours moving from one center to the other just to get an ECG done. By that time his condition had deteriorated and he was referred once again to the medical college for specialized care. Mr. X had no choice but to travel overnight in a bus to reach the medical college but it was too late for him. I was doing my thesis on heart attack patients. This incident and many similar incidents deeply affected me. They made me realize the urgent need for accessible and timely medical care, especially in the rural areas. Limited access to timely medical care, particularly for conditions like heart attack, where time is of the essence, was a grave concern. It was then that I decided to dedicate myself for finding a solution. A couple of years later, when I joined as faculty in one of the newly established medical colleges, I saw firsthand the deficiencies in rural hospitals. Although the CHCs were given ECG machines, they were all dumped in the stores because the MBBS doctors working there were not confident in their ECG skills. The shortage of specialist doctors made it difficult for the heart attacks to be diagnosed even in the district level hospitals. What to talk about the PHCs and CHCs? I knew something had to be done. So I wrote a proposal to the ICMR the Indian Council of Medical Research. The proposal aimed at establishing 24 by 7 tele-ECG service at the PHCs, enabling direct transfer of the heart attack patients to the medical colleges, bypassing intermediate level hospitals. Additionally, once the diagnosis was confirmed, we could safely give aspirin, which alone, if given early enough, reduced the mortality by over 50%. The ICMR accepted the proposal. They asked me to send a detailed project plan. Tell ECG. It was a fancy thing at that time. It was being used in a few corporate hospitals of India. And I was proposing to bring it to the villages. However, when I explored the existing tele ECG solutions in the market, I was taken aback by their exorbitant cost. The funds available were limited. And it seemed impossible to implement this project. But in the face of limited resources, innovation thrived. We discovered an unconventional solution using existing infrastructure. We combined an ordinary ECG machine with a fax machine that allowed us to transmit ECG images using telephone lines. The image obtained was good enough for a diagnosis. We tested the system successfully and it became the foundation of our project. With the help of ICMR, we received the funding, but the funding was just enough to equip eight PHCs out of the total 16 in the district. It was a mixed feeling, happiness of getting the necessary funds, but not being able to equip all the PHCs was the sad part. Anyways, we went ahead and established a command center in the medical college. And we trained 72 MBBS doctors all across the district in the ECG interpretation and management of heart attacks. We created a WhatsApp group for them during the training where all 72 doctors could access the training material. Then we identified the 8 PHCs to install machines in them and officially started the project. It was a slow start to the project. In the first week of operations, we reported 3 to 4 ECGs every day and they were all normal ECGs. While now we were getting impatient to diagnose our first heart attack using tele-ECG, fate had some other plans for us. We faced unexpected challenges with the fax based system, frequent power outages and telephone line disruptions during the ongoing monsoon season created numerous obstacles and brought the tele-ECG project to a halt. But then, in the face of these limited, these setbacks, one incident changed everything. One night, 
a doctor called and informed me that he had shared the image of an ecg through whatsapp on the tele ecg group i quickly examined the ecg and found that it was a heart attack i wrote back this is a heart attack give aspirin and immediately refer the patient to the medical college the management and referral plan were then discussed over the phone and i went back to sleep the next morning when i checked my whatsapp group again it was flooded with messages from all over the district the doctors were congratulating us for diagnosing a heart attack in the middle of the night <laughs> this was the first heart attack that we diagnosed using tele ecg not in the way that we had planned but it was a significant milestone from that moment on the tele ecg group flooded with images of ecgs it was just like that floodgates had opened the doctors who were not even part of this project started sharing their ecgs for reporting we promptly responded to every request diagnosing and guiding them the fax based system was abandoned all eight project sites switched to whatsapp for ecg sharing we were thrilled to see increasing number of ecgs even the hospitals that had dumped their ecg machines started using them again and shared the ecgs through whatsapp for reporting the image quality of whatsapp was far superior to the black and white images of the fax based system however we realized that we were deviating from the protocols and the patient confidentiality that needed to be ensured so we wrote to the icmr explaining the setbacks with the fax based system and proposed whatsapp as an alternative solution we also assured them that no ecg would contain patient identifiers while sharing it on a public platform like whatsapp the revised protocol was shared with all the doctors and the icmr approved it thereafter with whatsapp as a zero cost tele ecg solution anyone with heart attack walking into the village level phcs or chcs could get diagnosed within 5 minutes preliminary treatment was given and the patients were referred promptly to the medical college for specialized care bypassing the intermediary level hospitals the impact of this project was immense thousands of ecgs were reported and hundreds of heart attacks were diagnosed during the course of one year of this project the mbbs doctors they gained expertise in reading the ecgs and started diagnosing heart attacks on their own the need for tele ecg service diminished as their skills improved the research was accepted and presented at the american college of cardiology conference in chicago i was invited by the emergency medicine leadership and dr sagar galvankar to lead the international consensus statement on the low risk chest pain in india furthermore i got the opportunity to initiate an emergency cardiology fellowship in india even the whatsapp headquarters in us they recognized the significance of this project they expressed their interest to make a documentary on this but the project had concluded by then the best was yet to come the success of this project caught the attention of the icmr the icmr incorporated this led to expansion of this project to several states in india and the icmr incorporated free tenecti place injections each injection worth 40000 rupees at the phcs and chcs ensuring immediate treatment of heart attacks in the village level hospitals now in remote areas patients with suspected heart attacks were now being diagnosed and treated within minutes lives were saved and the results they surpassed our expectations this was like a dream come true for us very journey it is a testament to the power of innovation determination and collaboration together we can overcome challenges and transform healthcare for the better thank you
डॉक्टर हसमुख कुमार जैन आधार अभिनंदन आभार लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन लेट्स बिगिन नो नो आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू प्ले कॉन मैंने करोड़पति विथ यू बट आई एम डेफिनेटली गोइंग टू आस्क यू अ क्वेश्चन Did Einstein, Walt Disney, Sudha Chandran, and Bill Gates—they failed in their earlier lives? You may ask, what failure? And in the lives of these people, it's impossible. So let me tell you about each one of them one by one. Einstein—he was not even considered worthy to be admitted in Zurich Polytechnic School. Walt Disney, people laughed at him when he failed in his initial venture, Laughogram Studios. Ace Bharatanatyam dancer Sudha Chandran, you all know, her leg had to be amputated because of the tragic accident when she was just a teenager. And business tycoon Bill Gates, he failed in his initial venture, Trafo Data Company. So, does this tell you? that uh, failure does not come into the lives of such people yes failure does come into the lives of such people but they have overcome it with a challenge so we also have come through such challenges in our lives most of the stories of medicos sitting here must have started like this that you passed your 12th science and now the newer ones with the neat scores with flying colors and thought of getting into a college nearer to your school or a, sorry nearer to your home but what must have actually happened is that a few marks or percentages here and there your dreams get shattered and you land up in the hostel with the chichore gang you too must have had the kinds of acids the sex hours and the bevadas as your hostel mates but one place where everyone had to come together is the hostel mess and uh, sorry i forgot about this <laughs> is the hostel mess and there i encountered my first shock a cultural one of having people sitting next to me and eating non veg food coming from a jain family it was very difficult for me to adjust to such a thing and to add rub to and, and to add rub to my salt okay people both my room partners they were hardcore non vegetarians the acids in the hostel they tried to force me to at least try the juice of the non veg food but i had to sternly refuse them drinkers gang in the hostel they too offered me drinks in the parties which i had to politely refuse but taking me as a stubborn cultural man they respected my following of jainism in fact during pollution the festi holy holy festival of jains they not only provided me their bikes so that i could reach the nearby jain temple on time and have my dinner well before sunset today many of this hostel friends they themselves have become vegetarians anti totalers and uh, have inculcated similar habits in their next generation to my belief this is a wonderful cultural change that they have gained <laughs> dream big start small but at least start passing mbbs is one such dream uh, which needs to be forgotten soon as the next mammoth task that comes into somebody's life is getting into a pg degree for me coming from a business family i had no support from my uh, family to crack the pg entrance exam and therefore i had to settle down as a family doctor i had to bore this brunt for the next 5 years this academic shock what happened next was that 
I ran into one of my UG colleague who was doing super speciality in critical care at one of the premier hospitals in Mumbai. And like a sneer, he asked me, Bhai, tu kar kya raha hai? And I was like, Kena kya chate ho? He shook me to the core to try my luck once again at an impossible looking task of getting into the PG seat. But with his able guidance and some confidence, I was able to crack the PG entrance exam and managed to get a postgraduate diploma seat in Mumbai itself, which was naturally followed by DNB and multiple national and international fellowships. Next. Om Swastina Indro Vishwavedaha. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> okay. So you can understand that this was the beautiful moment in my life where gods themselves had come to bless me. I felt very uh, happy for this occasion. But three years later, family pressure started mounting on both of us. So we consulted a senior gynecologist who delivered babies for my mother as well as my mother-in-law since they both resided in the same area. <laughs> and it was discovered that there is no chance of natural pregnancy. So that senior gynecologist, he advised that you don't undergo IVF procedure till you have enough bank balance to undergo at least a dozen of there. My gosh, that means a lot of money at stake. So this was the fertility shock for the two of us. She cried. I couldn't even do that. But you can't ignore a senior doctor's advice. So we gradually built our big bank, bank balance over the next six years. And then coming from Jain family, we have to maintain that society status. So we consulted one of the topmost IVF specialists to whom almost half of the film industry consulted for fertility or no fertility issues. <laughs> so that uh, IVF specialist performed the procedures, but luck eluded us cycle after cycle. Till one day, he summoned us and said, it's enough, I give up. Enter into the picture, the elders of the family who raised the issue of Pitrudosh. And like Avatar Kishan and Radha of the 1983 epic movie Avatar, we were made to visit each and every temple in all corners of India. With this, we went back to the IVF specialist who initially refused us, but then gave in to our pressure. Eureka moment came in our life when the IVF specialist revealed your elders in the house were correct. Your prayers have been heard. Congratulations. Nine months later, we were blessed with a baby boy who is today a handsome teenager taller than both of us. Now, with family completed, multiple degrees in hand, I decided to venture into starting my own nuclear medicine therapy center. With high confidence, I approached the banks to offer me loans, who graciously offered me those loans to the tune of few crores, but at a very, very high interest rate. Work started in the rented premises, and I ventured into physical marketing, mostly on my two millers. On one such evening, when I was returning back from Mumbai, I started having chest pain and sweating profusely. I immediately went to a physician friend's nursing home and got an ECG done, just to confirm my fear that I had suffered a myocardial infarction. 
dreams shattered again. But my physician friend, he administered emergency medications and got me transferred to a tertiary care hospital. I was immediately transferred to the cath lab where it was diagnosed with coronary angiography that I had a 100% left circumflex artery occlusion. So he performed intracoronary thrombolysis. So far, so good, isn't it? But picture abhi baki hai mere dost. I suffered ventricular tachycardia and had to be administered DC shock, not once, but twice. Post this, ECG rhythm, uh, the cardiac rhythm was re-established. The cardiology team started smiling and my family too heaved a sigh of relief. Did I somewhere mention that I had cro loans worth crores of rupees? Yes, indeed. And in most medicals life, this is the problem. Because most of the doctors, they are never taught the financial management in their medical school. And this can start uh, with initially the educational loan to be followed by clinic or a hospital loan and then obviously by the equipment loan. And with such a burden, you will always feel like, <laughs> But as I have told you that I come from a business family, I knew the nuances of income expenditure I also knew the nuances of how to repay the loans. So I took the opportunity wherever I could pay those extra EMIs or close down certain loans which were not charging me any premature closure charges. With this, I could manage a healthy bank balance and I improved my civil score so that I can get more loans in future. <laughs> So now with a healthy life, I had a healthy bank balance also. So to summarize, to summarize Einstein, Walt Disney, Sudha Chandran and Bill Gates are just a few names who have conquered their failures and have become legends in their life. To end, I would say that Survival can be summed up in three words, never give up. I fought all along and I never gave up. Thank you. C. Sindhu Dhar. Namaskar. Namaste. Welcome. Hello, how are you doing? How are you doing? Some of you might be wondering about this guy who looks like he has tribal origin, speaking in Bengali. And wishing you in Tamil. Let me help you out. I am from one of the sister state of Northeast, the beautiful seven sister state, and I am representing Tripura. To 
today I am going to speak about my journey from Tripura to learning Tamil where everything around me has changed. So I hung into one constant and that's emergency medicine. Youthful minds always think about doing something good in their life. Thinking about the change, I was not different. Living in a remotest part of the country without access to quality education and teaching program was always my hurdle to face. But when hardship meets passion, nothing can stop you. After I completed my MBBS in 2013, I was posted in a hilly remotest part of the state. Malaria was endemic that region, but that served well for my cause of serving the people back to my state. But I questioned myself again and again about the care I was delivering. Was it scientifically sound? Was it truly beneficial to the patients? Am I delivering quality emergency care to the patients of the state? Now this thought process drove me towards focusing on emergency medicine. I started my preparations like any young guy for NEET and Central Institute exams back then and I successfully matched into the speciality of emergency medicine in Jipmer, Pondicherry. Emergency medicine was very new for me as I had no previous understanding about this subject and like any young mind who will be seeing the American TV shows, I was also searching my answer in those American TV shows. And guess what? I found my answer in a very small TV show called Grey's Anatomy. From that day, I kept my constant in my life as EM. I was ecstatic to land into this beautiful state filled with culture and diversity. But with the euphoria of success, it came into a realization. I not only landed myself into a different state, but I landed myself into a whole new language. I have to learn a new medicine as well as a new language to keep my constant alive. In the midst of these realizations, I almost lost my candidature in a rather unnerving incident. One small piece of paper called uh, No Objection Certificate was required for the authentication of my candidature was given in a duplicate to me by my authorities. And guess what? I realized that after reaching Pondi. I was about to lose my dream which I was seeing for last four years. I quickly hopped to the bus, went to Chennai, took the flight, went to Kolkata. It was 9 p.m. at the night. No further flights. All the flights were running full next day. My heart was in my throat because I was about to lose my dream. But luck, God, karma, divine intervention, whatever you believe has intervened. I got my ticket to Agartala, but again, nature had some different plans. The sky went cloudy, the flights got delayed. But eventually, I took the flight and went to Agartala, convinced my authorities about the importance of that piece of paper, took the paper with me into the airport, only to find that the whole airport tarmac is under water. I was seeing my dream drowning in that. But, wo kehte hai na, ki kisi cheez ko agar aap dil se chaho, to puri kainat usko aapko milane me lag chati. The flight of my dream took off from Agartala and I reached my destination just six hours before my counseling has started. 
like I did in every step of my life, I fight for this great speciality. Chipmar embraced me like a mother with an open arms. But even before settling into this new place, I found that I have to learn this ancient culturally rich language so that I can talk, interpret, communicate with the patients so that I can keep my constant DM alive. So what did I do? I started reading Hindi interpreted Tamil books, watching Tamil movies, yes with English subtitles of course and I was a big fan of those movies. Still, I was not able to grasp the language. Raise your hand if you know the meaning of word chumma in Hindi. I know, I feel 99% of you might have known. But do you know there are different meaning of chumma when you say in Tamil? If somebody tell you, chumma wa, don't mess with him. He is a very dangerous fellow. He doesn't like you. Taking a sip of coffee in a coffee shop, your friend is asking, what are you doing? Chumma, I am taking some sip of coffee. That is an ideal chumma. Some patients coming through the door, telling you, Sir, chumma matra eldi kudunge. Write some medications and give it off. That is a different chumma. So, one of my EM technicians give me a piece of advice one day. He says, listen to the people. What they are saying, how they are saying, when they are saying. Take a note, revise it. Now with that piece of wisdom, within 8 months of entering this department, I started speaking in Tamil. In full sentences, though not quite in grammar, but definitely it was understandable and communicable with the patients. One hurdle was crossed, but I knew it is not the last. I was learning managing medical emergencies with the help of my seniors, my colleagues, my teachers, left and right. But managing other emergencies like surgical, OVG, pediatric emergency medicine, I was not learning much about them and it was forming large gaps in my knowledge. Question arises in my mind. Whether they are medicina da emergency adequate, some people try to tell me emergency medicine is a critical care medicine. But I knew it was wrong. I wanted my constant EM. Now that drove me towards searching for my answers in other specialities or other TV shows, whatever I can get to learn that emergency medicine. And that drove me towards emergency medicine EM Gurukul. The age old style of learning with gurus and the most precious among them is my finding, my Dronacharya of life, Dr. Sagar Galvankar sir. <laughs> EM Gurukul taught me what I was hoping to learn in emergency medicine. The art of managing emergency anywhere, anytime, any place. Saving a life when it matters the most. We would read 40 pages a week, attend lectures, given weekend exams. 24 7 connection with the mentors makes learning not only fun, but actually it is deeply embedded inside the memory. It wasn't easy after no finishing those exhaustic shifts, coming back, reading continuously, then attend those lectures. But when you have a fire inside of learning, nothing can stop you. After finishing one year with EM Gurukul, I finished the whole book, the Gita of EM, Tintinale's Emergency Medicine, and managed to revise it, not once, but twice before my final exam. Not just the academia, but EM Gurukul taught me how precious a life is. I 
pledged to serve my people back to my state. So I went back home, started my journey back from zero to my state. I started working from the scratch and as Patanjali sir was saying, the casualty which sir was seeing that time, that the same casualty I was seeing one year back. Working in algorithms of 90s, hardly saving any emergency patients. Getting equipment to getting a manpower, everything was a battle. But this time, Emergency Medicine Association of India stood with me. They hold my hand, not only for me, but for the well-being of an entire state. And slowly together, EMA does not hesitate to support a leader, be it a young rookie like me or older person who is working for this speciality. And I was recently conferred with the prestigious post of Regional Secretary for Eastern Zone of EMA. So we started building the department physically, first with the organization and the resource stockings. Taking the space, created dedicated resuscitation bay, etc. Let me ask you, all of you, one question. Suppose you receive in your ED one patient who is in unconscious. You connected the cardiac monitor and it is showing ventricular tachycardia, VTAC. What will you do? Shock them, but where is the defib? The answer is nowhere in the whole hospital. So next, I started getting all the emergency equipment necessary for managing those life-threatening emergencies. Got a defib, standardized the crash cart with necessary drugs, got an IVs, ventilators, point of care ultrasounds, etc. Emergency medicine management of emergency patients requires time sensitive emergency skills. But when there is no DFib in a hospital, you can hardly dream of for those skills. Yes, I wrote the emergency skills both by written protocols as well as given hands on training to the enthusiastic juniors of emergency medicine department of my state. During all this battle, I went through lots of hardship, begging the authority for basic equipment to literally crying to thrombolize a young STEMI guy. Some of people went further to make a mock of me, saying that, do you really think you can bring back the patient of cardiac arrest to life? Oh, that means you are a demigod. My family started questioning my duty towards them. My wife gave me a choice between her and EM. But believe me, I hold into one constant. That's EM. Of course, my wife also stayed. I dream for a good quality emergency care for my people back for my state. My journey The dress I wear, the people I was living, but one thing remained the same. From Tripura to learning Tamil and back to the state, only one thing. That's emergency medicine. Thank you.
डॉक्टर इंद्रानी सरदेसाई माय पेरेंट्स आर इन द ऑडियंस टुडे टेन इयर्स अगो ऑगस्ट ऑफ ट्वेंटी थर्टीन माय मदर टोल माय फादर तिला जा सागरला भेटवा टेन इयर्स अगो ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी थर्टीन आय टोल डॉक्टर सागर डॉक्टर सागर आई डोंट वॉन्ट टू डू इमर्जन्सी मेडिसिन मला येत नाही आय एम नॉट इंटरेस्टेड ऑगस्ट ऑफ ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री आय हॅव स्पेंड टेन इयर्स इन इमर्जन्सी मेडिसिन अँड आय कॅन नॉट ड्रीम ऑफ डुईंग एनिथिंग एल्स अँड ओव्हर द कोर्स ऑफ माय टाईम वर्किंग इन इमर्जन्सी मेडिसिन इट्स हाय इंटेन्सिटी इट इज फास्ट पेस इट इज इंटरेस्टिंग आय हॅव डिव्हेलप्ड अन इंटरेस्ट in the concept of design in emergency medicine and in life why because design is everywhere it's not just in those two flow charts design is in this auditorium design is in the clothes that we wear design is in the food that we eat it's in the neural networks of our brains it's in the chambers of our heart design is everywhere but not every design is good we've all seen flow charts that are overwhelming that you look at them and your eyes hurt but more than that your brain hurts you want to use it but you can't figure out how on the other hand we've all seen designs that have helped us deliver good care to our patients that have saved lives and we have seen those designs in work today so i thought to myself what is the difference between these two why is one design good one is bad i looked at a lot of samples i looked at good design i looked at bad design i looked at medical products i looked at non medical products and after analyzing the similarities and the differences I came up with this formula. Now we all have ideas at different points in our life. You've seen some of those ideas to fruition today. But having an idea is not enough. You have an idea, you have to make it look attractive. You have to make it sound attractive if you want to sell that idea. Okay you've made it look attractive you made it sound attractive you have a very meaningful idea you want to make a change in this world that won't happen if your idea is not functional if it is not simple if it is not utilizable by every single person who you are targeting that is the reason for this design but everything does start with an idea and i'll give you an example from my work to do that i must tell you a story to tell you a story you have to picture an emergency department you're working in a busy emergency department it's coming up on 10 o'clock at night you've been running between the chest pains that could be acs the headaches that can be subarax the coughs that could be pneumonia and the worried well that are none of these things and your night shift is starting to come in you are starting to wind up but just as that happens you hear a commotion from the waiting area there's a boy 5 years old he is standing next to a man 30 years old and they are both horrified because they are standing next to a woman who is on the ground the mother the wife she is in moving she is in breathing but you are emergency medicine doctors within minutes you are in the resuscitation room and she is getting chest compressions she is getting access she is getting airway she is getting drugs and you go through your 4 h's and your 4 t's i think i think i think this must be a pulmonary embolism 
I think this is a PE. Now, because you've considered PE, you are considering thrombolysis. And because you're considering thrombolysis, you're considering alteplase. But you have a moment of brain freeze. Alteplase ka dose kya tha? Was it 10 milligrams stat and 90 infusion? No, no, no. It was 50 milligrams stat, 50 bolus again if we need it, right? Okay. Fine. Let's tell that to the nursing team. And the nursing team says, okay, I'll get alteplase. They look at the box, they pull out the alteplase and they say, I've never done this before. The nurse is newly qualified. She's only worked in the emergency department for around six, seven months. She's never seen alteplase given, let alone giving it herself. It's not that difficult. You mix sterile water with 50 mils of alteplase. Fortunately, there was a senior nurse around and she helped and she said, okay, let's talk you through it. Let's do it together. We'll get this done. And this patient received the right drug at the right time in the right dose. But that made me think, that made me have an idea. This could have been a source of delay. This could have been a source of error. And in medicine, we learn a lot of our lessons from what could have been and how to prevent that from happening. And so that idea started nagging at me. And I started asking the questions, does anyone else also have difficulty prescribing certain infusions? Calculating the dose of GTN when you're in a high intensity situation and someone has flash pulmonary edema in front of you. It's scary. You can't think of maths. My communication breaks down. Forget my mathematic ability. Right? Does anyone else have that problem? Yes. When we have that problem, do you know where to look? We do kind of. The answers were very, very variable. Okay, do our nurses know how to give these medications, how to prepare them, how to reconstitute them and how to deliver them? And yes, there was an obvious lack of confidence there. Variable. The skill mix in emergency medicine is variable. And so I thought I want to achieve one big objective by hitting four targets. I want to simplify prescription complexity. I want to create a uniform format so all the doctors write it in one similar manner. I want to make all the resources available in one place. And I want to include information about drug preparation. So we don't have to spend time in thinking about this. And the overarching aim was to reduce stress, reduce prescription errors, and reduce the time taken to prescribe. Now you have an idea, you go to a stakeholder. Without stakeholder, you can't do anything. My idea was about medication, so I went to the lead pharmacist of the department. It's her job to deal with adherence to safety standards in medicine. Um, it's her job to deal with prescription errors and complaints. And she was instantly on board. Sarah and I became partners, and we call this project IMPRESS. Improved prescribing. IMPRESS. She took it to the pharmacy lead of the entire hospital and they said, yes, please go ahead. They were going to invest money and buy this from someone else. They said, Fukat ka ho hai, kar do. fine. I went to my consultants and the different tiers of doctors in my department and they said, yes, please, we want something to make our lives easier. Go ahead. And so Project Impress started. Now we started making plans and whenever you make a plan, you do so with the intention of getting it right the first time. No one is starting a plan and saying, okay, uh, let's make some draft and they can get aage karke. We try to get it right the first time. But the final product often does not resemble your first iteration. And that is a good thing because that means that you are dynamic and that means that your design is dynamic. So the first version that we developed was this one. 
and you can see that there are a lot of different colors, different fonts. It's a little bit jarring to the eyes and the main information that a person needs to prescribe is hidden, it's scrunched up in that one little box on the side. With a lot of feedback and with a lot of collaboration, we came on to this. Now, on the face of it, it looks impressive. You know, there's a GTN bottle, there's a heart cup picture. It tells you what is the physiology that GTN works and why it works. Now, the problem with it, my eyes first go to the picture. And if I wanted to reduce the time to prescription, I cannot take the time to teach. And so this had to go. My eyes then go to this GTN on top afterwards. Then they go down to this monitor at the bottom, another picture. And then finally it comes to that information. And my God, is there a lot of information. When you're trying to write GTN prescription, your hand is shaking. Your head is melting. There's sweat running down your brow. And then you have to figure out what does 10 microgram per minute mean in mLs per hour. There's a lot of information. And to explain why this is a problem, I'll take a moment to explain the cognitive load theory. Cognitive load theory is absolutely fantastic. I suggest having a look at it for yourselves. But the gist of it is that working memory is limited. And there are three kinds of cognitive load. Intrinsic cognitive load is the inherent difficulty of the topic at hand. So in our example, the difficulty of figuring out the GTN prescription. Germane cognitive load is the effort it takes our brains to make this into a stable long-term memory. These two loads are not in our hands, especially not in the moment. But what is in our hands is extraneous cognitive load. Extraneous cognitive load is the manner in which we present information. And that is what design is all about. So we can actively reduce the burden on our own minds. So the final iteration was this one. And this is now live in my department. And what we did was, there's not much color involved in this. There's fixed amount of color. There are no graphics, there's fixed amount of buttons at the bottom. The information that you need at hand is at the forefront. And my eyes go to that stop sign. Those are the precautions you must take before prescribing. Aptly, you are looking at the right document. So let's compare it to my formula for good design. Is this meaningful? I'm going to reduce stress, or well, that's the hope. I'm going to reduce the time to prescription, and I'm going to reduce the uh, prescription errors. OK, meaningful project. Is it aesthetic? Yes, now it is. It is readable. It is simple. Is it efficient? Did it hit my four targets? Does it reduce prescription simplicity? Yes, it is now simple. Does it create a uniform format of writing? Yes, it does. The format is given to you in the box itself. Do our nurses know how to prepare the medications? Yes, the constitution formula is given below. So yes, it hits the targets. OK. But don't take my word on how good my design is. Sarah and I implemented some tests. We got, got together emergency medicine doctors and we got together acute medicine doctors. And we said, okay, we are going to give you 10 medications to prescribe. The 10 are in front of you on the screen. And of these 10 medications, we said five, half the group do uh, five with Impress, our project. Half the group do five using any resource, any resource of the doctor's choice. Whatever you can reach fastest. And we got them to swap so that everyone had a chance to use Impress. And the numbers are in front of you. But let me make it easier for you. On average, we reduced the time to prescription by 45%. When I made this project Impress, it was to implement in my department in emergency medicine. The acute medics were so impressed with it 
no pun intended, that now it's used across the hospital. And that, my friends, is the power of good design. <laughs> Where else can you use design? Design is not just artwork. Design is not decoration. Design is intelligence made visible. I've used it in some other parts of my portfolio. So I've made an allergy management leaflet for patients so that patients know what symptoms they are experiencing. Is that mild? Is that moderate? Is that severe? If it is a moderate reaction, what medications should I take? What time should I take them? Who should I call? It's in the hands of the patients. It is simple to use. Patients use it every day. I use it a lot in medical education. And in fact, the uses in medica medical education are vast, especially if you engage in FOMED, which is free open access medical education. It doesn't matter where you use design. It doesn't matter if you're doing it on some kind of visual project. It doesn't matter if you're using it for a slideshow. And it doesn't matter if you're using it for a project that you are developing. But you have to be dynamic. You have to change. You have to make it work. You have to change with it. And do consider using my formula for good design. You can reach me in these addresses if you want to talk design, if you want my help with design. Thank you. That is in my formula. Dr. Manu Ayani. Games are exciting, right? We have all played games. If you rewind, if you go back to your kindergarten days, you would remember that you started learning by playing games. But what happens after that? There's this real sudden change in your uh, way in which we are talking, way in which we are being taught. We are put in these halls. And there are benches and desks, and we sit on it, and this is what happens. <coughs> and now, suddenly, playing becomes opposite of learning. So, Dr. Stuart Brown, in his book, uh, Play, he was the founder of National Institute of Play, wrote that opposite of playing is not learning. It is depression. And when thinking about games, you know what memories which brings me back to gaming is that when I actually was starting to game, during my internship, I was really engrossed in the 
different worlds of gaming. But after internship, what happened was that gaming took, took a back seat. I had to go to a EM residency program, do the EMB residency program, and then after that, transforming from the a resident to a faculty, I come across this challenge. This challenge of teaching young emergency medicine residents who are these millennials, millennial learners, or these tech savvies who are having very short attention span. Most of them, what I found were all visual learners and auditory learners. They wanted things in their hand quickly. And they preferred more interactive and collaborative learning methods. And in emergency medicine, what I'm really passionate about when I do is point of care <coughs> ultrasound and simulation. So this kept on thinking how I was, you know, how I could amalgamate these two and train these young residents who are, you know, your way above your, uh, you know, thought process or your thinking styles. So then this idea came into my mind. Why not, why not build a game? Now, but then how to do this? What strategy could I use? And then this, you know, this really struck me. This reminded me of the old mythological strategy, battle formation strategy, which was used in, uh, which is depicted in Mahabharata, Chakravi, where your warriors had to battle through layers of soldiers. And each layer was tougher from outer to inner. So, taking this essence of one of the greatest battle formations, which was impenetrable, I built a game. And then Sono Chakravivu was born. So, I created a chakra view where each level was very carefully designed to take learners across different realms of learning, also inculcating the game mechanics into it. And let me tell you what happened beyond that is phenomenal. We had these layers specifically designed that each layer had different, different difficulty and ultimately it culminated into a amalgamation of simulation with ultrasound. So I would, you know, call it SimSono, but then, you know, idea was to make sure these residents go through a game mechanics and we had teams coming in from all across the country. The first year when we started in 2018 in PHU, we had registered 10 teams, but when they came and we, you know, or when we started the games, you know, people start, started coming, like, can I, can I come and join the game? So there were ultimately 16 teams who really participated. The first Sono games or first ultrasound games and they tried to battle and get and win the Sono Arjuna Award. And for the last three, four years, we have been running this every year. If you would see the enthusiasm in them was really, really big. And the fun part of this is that it really changed the landscape. You know, what happened is the residents who were actually doing and winning the game came back to us and told, can I come in as a Sono Chakraviyu faculty? Can we take this forward? Can we take this to another level where we could add on new things to it? 
So, but it's not just a game. It's gamification. So what you saw here is basically gamification. What gamification means is that putting game-like design or game design mechanics into a non-game context. And it's just not putting in something and trying to build something out. It's really carefully planned. Gamification, if you look at, it really transforms the way in which learners actually learn. So there is a science behind it. So there is a group, a group really looks at gamification psychology, where they found that these learners or these users who are in these game-based settings, when they play these games, their brains actually transform, their brains actually work in unison. There's real harmony in the brain, and this is research. And they found dopamine being secreted, and this actually led them to be motivated, led them to be actually thinking motivated and be in that game moment. And what also they found was there was huge retention. There was almost 80 percentage increase in the retention of the knowledge which we were, they were actually getting, you know, through the game. And all these actually were actually imprinted onto the long-term memory of these learners. So you would ask me, can I can I do this? Can we actually, you know, put this onto our learning platform? Can you, as a teacher, teach with this gaming method? Absolutely, absolutely. And I call it Uncle, an unconventional learning method. It's really an unconventional learning method. So, if you have seen different films, there are films which really portray how unconventionally you could teach things. Same way, it's an unconventional learning method. So, I would tell you that gamification has four eyes. Gamification simulates four eyes in learners. Involvement, interaction, and uh, inculcation and uh, intimacy. So these are four eyes in gamification which we know, which actually is transformed into these learners. So let me give you my formula for gamification, which I've learned during these years of you know, building this game and taking it forward. So when you try to gamify, as a beginner, you would set goals. And you need to align these goals to the learning objectives, which you would want your learners to take from the game. Now you would try to make it engaging. You would try to really make it engaging to bring in a lot of things into it. But make sure that it is achievable. This is something which you need to take care of. And also, knit in narrative structure into the game. This is something which you need to really look at when you are trying to build a game. Built in narrative structure. And ultimately, when you are trying to build a game, you build in your process mechanics of the game, where you take them through different levels. Provided you make sure that they get immediate feedback. And these feedbacks are the learning elements there. It's like any other game, when you fail, you get the feedback. And in gamification, when you level up, it is not a reward which you get on the screen. This is real world knowledge and skill which you gain. So, are you up for this challenge? Are you up to redefine, re-innovate the way in which we are teaching our residents? So, let's play the game.
let's the play the game of education let's be on the adventure of redefining fostering change and changing this young minds young healers who are our, our next generation it's game on So we'll go for the lunch break now and we'll meet uh, at 2.25 uh, again here, 2.25 p.m. Thank you. Everybody, please realize 2:30 sharp. We have to reassemble because we will close the studio. 2:30 is the last. The best three talks are in the afternoon. After that, there is a there is a discussion forum, and then we'll go for convocation. So we need about 40 minutes for VIPs to arrive. So we will have that gap in there. Okay, thank you.
डॉक्टर श्रेयश पटेल गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन केम छो मजा मा लेट मी ब्रिंग यू ऑल टू लैन ऑफ माय मेमोरी इट वाज द टाइम व्हेन बर्ड्स वेर चर्पिंग आउटसाइड वेकिंग अप द सिटी रेन वाज फॉलिंग जेंटली providing a cool respite from the heat inside the hospitals the scene was much different emergency room was hive of activity people were coming and going wheelchair wheelchair were goes in and out nurses were shouting orders in the corner of that room a young man sat slumped on the chair he was looking sad and guilty his eyes were full of worries the doctors and nurses gathered around him talking quietly he was the doctor who has just started his residency in emergency medicine he was attending a patient who met with an accident his condition was serious despite of everything he could not able to survive him and unfortunately patient died he sat in the chair looking at the floor thinking about the patient that died doctors and nurses were trying to console him that you did your best there is nothing that you can do to save him but that was the unfortunate event he was not able to shake the feeling of guilt he was not listening to anyone the only things that he can hear is these words that resounded we should all learn from our failures ladies and gentlemen that was me dr sriyas patel who witnessed that patient who died in front of me and that brings few question in my mind who should be allowed to make mistake every what kind of mistake everyone allowed to every time a kid who is riding a bicycle or learning a bicycle can make mistake multiple times but a pilot if he makes mistake can crash the airplane and kill everyone if a helmsman who see break a ship can drowning everyone on the board and a doctor if make mistakes could kill a patient these are the specialty that are not allowed to make mistakes they have to be extra cautious they should know about the risk they should know how to mitigate that risk for that they can do multiple training excessive training changing protocol being disciplined it is also important to understand it's not always the person's fault that lead to failure it could be unavoidable circumstances like equipment failure or the atmospheric change but the bottom line is pilots helmsmen doctors cannot afford mistakes if they do they should learn from the mistake and avoid to make it again happen in the future so the question is how can we do that or how can we achieve that by practice and practice doctors are having a such a position that they cannot afford the mistake they should be up to date with the clinical knowledge should go underwent excessive training and despite of that training people do mistake sometime but these are so minor that we can neglect that but if the mistake is major it can lead to devastating changes and that we cannot afford and hence come the learning so that we can reduce this mistake so how can we achieve that by a new beautiful word that is simulation let me know how many of you heard this word or feel this word simulation yeah i can see majority of you right so the simulation is the new norms in the various industries human management sales automobiles defense banking and even health simulation too 
over a period of time, health simulation has spanned centuries. From the initial days of the anatomical model to the AR, VR simulation centers. In the beginning, it was just the anatomical models that are available for the students to learn the human anatomy. They were very rude, crude and inaccurate, but that was the best that available at that time. As the technology advances, we have multiple things with us that can teach the students more better. The preserved cadaveric tissue can give the advantage to students to feel it, the human organs and to learn the medical education. The recent anesthetic simulators can give chance the students to learn the anesthesia without giving harm to the patient. The latest one, the modern human simulators are the best one. They are so realistic and they are so safer that you can do anything on that. Simulation is now the essential thing in the medical education. In the COVID-19 era, when we try to reduce the patient interaction, we were searching for the alternatives so that we can teach the students and simulation was the natural fit. There is nothing wrong to say it has a very better future. Even simulation can be used in the research. But when we are talking simulation, 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 there are few philosophical questions. Where is the doctor when we are talking about the simulation? When we are talking about the evaluation? from the anatomical model to the simulation world, where is doctor? So, I would try to give the answer to this question by narrating you the two. Suppose it is a Karan Johar movie and the title of the movie is Doctor of the Year. The scene is high tech simulation lab where we have the different, different, different mannequins, high end mannequins, high fidelity mannequins with a high budget. To make it blockbuster hit, we require multiple things. We require many people. We require Dr. Siddharth Malhotra who plays a role of doctor. We require Sister Alia who assists Dr. Siddharth. Right? We require Mr. Varun Dhawan who simulated patient who is having the chest pain. And we also require none other than Karan Johar who is the director of medical simulation. Along with that, we require script writers, etc., 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 high tech. The other extents, there are another director like Ram Gopal Verma, who is also famous for its offbeat cinema. It will be high tech, but it will have the high. He has a very unique style build up. So this is the role. The doctor director who can make this film. When we when we are talking or the role of doctor is the role of Or the pace as the is required practically also simulation cannot create all the real it is really tough to get back the student to the moment of that suspended belief if something goes wrong. It requires lots and lots of efforts from the trainer to create an effective, meaningful experience so that students can learn. Even students will also know the consequences of the failure in the simulation. The trainers who are giving the trainers should be well aware with the hardware as well as the software they also have to be clinical competent to give the adequate feedback. So when we are talking about the high fidelity, high tech, everything, can we also think about the low fidelity, no cost technique? 
Suppose if I say you are there in the emergency, it's early morning 5, one ambulance arrive and it brings a patient that is 65 year old lady who is a non case of hypertension and diabetes and presented to you with the chest pain. How will you manage that? First, second, third. It is the best example for that. So it is important to understand that high simulation or the good simulator does not require high end fidelity. A live actor can be a simulator. So S can be a procedure or a scenario. A soft skill training can be a simulation model. When we are talking about the high fidelity, again the question is still there. What about the patient? If we cannot replace the patient, what can we do? In the stream like music, arts and the sports, where the selection is solely based on the performance, the blind audience or the evaluator can be used to reduce the biases so that each and everyone can get the equal chance to succeed. So can't we think about biases in the simulation too? India has the high diversity in itself. And this is its uniqueness, its strength. But when we talk about this diversity, it can lead to bias in the simulation. If practically say, in the real world, whenever we are talking about the high fidelity or the simulation, it seems like the Indians are treating foreigners, not the Indians. Am I right? Can we address these challenges? Can we address this diversity? We can do. The first option that we can do is think about the diversity. We can think about mannequin to make more Indian, to make simulation more towards the Indian style. The another way to deal this challenge is to have a VR system. With the virtual reality, we can create a scenario with which a trainee can be trained to deal with a patient who is with the different customs, different language or different place. So the ultimately question is, can we make the simulation more towards the Indian side? Can we make it more Indian? Can we make it more emotional? Can we use the VR and create the scenarios that can help our trainees to learn more better? I think we can do it. As the technology advances, the every question's answer is yes. The only thing is required, that is will. If we can do that, we can definitely make a better Indian simulation world. I would like to end my talk by asking a question, can't we learn from our failures and make it Indian? Yes, Thank you.
डॉक्टर अंकित कुमार साहू सो हम्बल नमस्कार फ्रॉम द लैंड ऑफ जगन्नाथ पुरी वट टू टेल अबाउट मी टूडे I don't think that is necessary excuse me I have just cleaned my glasses are you ready to clean your glasses to look research at a different perspective are you yes thank you so coming to research whenever we come across the term called as research what do we think what i was thinking and many of my friends will also be thinking the same what is research i don't know mathematics how can i do research i don't know bio statistics how can i do research i am not uh, proficient in writing in english how can i write and sometimes we also think research is something it is for an elite group of academicians not for me not a cup of my tea but is it so so today in my journey of residency we will be discussing something about research residency so here all my resident friends uh, through my journey will be able to yes it is a possible the first thing that to be remembered is like whatever whatever we want to learn we learn by doing most effective way of learning and the first thing in our career in early phase is thing <laughs> we don't like this thing so what about thesis uh, the first seed that we can sow for diving deep into the field of research so let's start with a small five years i joined residency in january 2019 and in our institute we have call within 6 4 to 6 months of joining so what do we know about thesis we, we have no idea because we have just passed out from undergraduate days about protocol our thesis guide will give and we'll follow that idea yeah, that what talk, what a interested so a thesis on dengue dengue comes in epidemics every 2 to 3 years that you have data collection within 6 months is if you are not will not be able to thesis during next 2 years so because of that discuss have you not collected 300% still now still now afraid of sir uh, looking at him that he will ask me this thing ki how many day, how many patients you have recruited so because of him i was able to complete my data collection within next 6 to 8 months obviously dengue epidemic was going on so i did it but it is not an impossible thing for any resident because whatever thesis topic are being given to us as a resident it is not a big multi center randomized control trial which will take 3 years 4 years 10 years to recruit the patients it will take uh, maybe 8 months to 12 months we can complete our data collection so aaj soon sooner you collect your data that will help you that will give you more time to focus during residency so yes in december 2019 i thought i'll write my thesis paper by myself uh, i have no i had no idea about bio statistics no software knowledge was there so i tried to learn by myself because i had ample amount of time to learn how to analyze your own thesis so when in december 2019 i was able to present that in em india 2019 Four years earlier, we wrote the thesis, submitted it into the uh, submitted into the thesis committee, and meanwhile, because of writing, uh, I was able to complete my writing. Uh, this got published in Journal of Medical Virology before submission of my thesis thesis to the thesis committee, and that boosted me up. So, what boosted me up to go into the field of research in emergency medicine was this thing: presenting in EM India. we'll talk about that later and publishing your own thesis so take thesis seriously because that is the first thing in your career which will help you to move forward in the field of research but if you have not done thesis properly there are many residents who are just exam going maybe senior residents maybe young faculties what can we do 
we'll see so first thing is try writing or analyzing thesis by yourself take help of teachers take help of online resources because we have an amp we have ample ample amount of resources maybe youtube coursera icmr website who website everywhere there are ample amount of research um, uh, resources that mean median mode in excel sheet which you have uh, which we have prepared for a thesis data collection we can go into the youtube search for how to find all these things and it is very easy so yes that can be done friends will help you and only by you can do that later so the first milestone in thesis and if at all uh, we have passed that that we have completed our thesis still there is a lot of time we can dive into the field so why I am talking so much about residen uh, residency research because for a resident before going to postgraduate medical examination you have to have as per the NMC mandate you have to have one research poster or paper that should be presented in a national or international conference you may have a published paper or a paper which is in line of publication so that is one of the important nmc mandate so that's why in em india we give podium to everyone so this is for this reason only for every resident who is submitting us the abstract after careful reviewing and maybe improving improving that we are giving podium to everyone so what next uh, even after thesis completion of your thesis what next you can catching the low hanging fruit in research what are those things first thing as i was speaking about speaking at em india tracks and among which 40% were from residents who are on training and most of them has submitted their case reports submitted their thesis interim analysis and all so that's a great thing so em india come present at em india because that will give you a podium where you can present you will be confident you can get reviewed you can get feedback from your peers from experts and most important you can talk with everyone so that you can have a new ideas that can be generated and you can do it in your own department or later on in your life there are some other low hanging fruits that we can work on is images every day day to day life you are getting at least one person who will have a very uh, impactful academic clinical image that can be published so look for that and how to look for that go and read the good academic em journals because from that only you will have an idea that yes this can be published this can be published this cannot be published so images case reports and editorials are the very uh, low hanging fruit that can be caught up in. but before that whenever you are planning to write or publish something you should know your market if you are uh, grooming a tree you should know where to sell the tree and there are a lot of emergency medicine journals from annals of emergency medicine resuscitation to our journal our own journal journal of emergency trauma and shock so you can go ahead submit your paper learn the process of submission because during that period of time only you will learn a lot of things and during the review process of the journal you will learn how to write a paper because on the first go you might not be able to even clear the technical review on the first go but as time passes you will be able to know what is to be written how it has to be uh, uh, managed in a word file so those are the small small things that is necessary but once you start then only you will be able to do it so as uh, with the help of my teachers with the help of my friends by god grace yes i grew into from a seed to a plant and this was the pubmed at uh, PubMed search which I did two weeks earlier and humbly speaking yes we were able to publish 51 articles within last five years and it's not impossible <laughs> but as you grow in the field see whatever we will do 
once we step inside it only we will be able to find out what is there. So at first thesis might look very, uh, it is a curriculum based, so we are forced to do the thesis. But as you uh, go through the process, you will find some different topics, whatever you will like. So I and my team are interested in community CPR programs. So we did a community CPR program in three villages of Lucknow, which got uh, published and that paper itself with the help of that paper, ICMR funded us 50 lakhs of rupees to conduct it in Delhi wide school uh, schools. So once you start doing, you will start liking it and once you start liking something, you will do great in it. Thank you. Dr. Raymond Kumar. Hi, good afternoon or good evening, whatever you can say. Good pre evening. And before I start, I'll give an assurance. I think this is the last session we have. So, not to get restless. And I have to change my script completely uh, because it's a very tough task being last speaker and whatever I thought speak, everything's been spoken. So, now I'll do what I'm good at. I'm a management consultant and anybody knows what management consultants do? Even I don't know. <laughs> so there is a joke in corporate world that consultants come, they look at your watch and say what's time. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing. I'll summarize what I've said till now. We have seen emergency medicine is very challenging. There are a lot of challenges which have been faced, are being faced and will be faced. But question is, are the doctors responsible? Can doctors solve these challenges on their own? For example, uh, Dr. Nayas uh, said that problem with emergency, doctors are overworked. There are no solutions. Then dead patient comes and doctor says, shouts, does not have a good communication skill. Then we covered something about cognitive overload, but there is a related concept known as thinking fast, thinking slow. There is Nobel laureate, Daniel, Kahneman has written a book and it says that our brain has got two parts. So we all are doctors. I will not go on the neurophysiology, but on anthrophysiology point of view, anthropsychology point of view, there is one brain which is reflective brain, which acts very fast. And there is reflective brain, which is outer brain, which is revolved later and needs effort to work on. Then we had about discussion on a quick decision making or split second decision making where our reflexive brain comes to play. But can we go to outer brain? The doctor who shouted probably he was too engrossed in saving the patient. The thought could not get into outer brain and think I should react in this manner. So we have a lot of cases where we see there is patient doctor conflict or community medical medicine conflict. Are these conflicts arise because of problems or issues with doctor? We can say easily doctors are not good at communication. Is it correct? No, because they don't have sufficient energy, time to think rationally on this, on this subject. They are overworked. They cannot increase manpower. Trolleys are not working. Doctors cannot go and get trolleys repaired. It's issue of policy, governance. And now we are corporate world as well. And I'll give one story, uh, two stories in fact. One from corporate, one from government hospital. So somewhere in Mumbai, an intern was sitting in casualty, a uh, polytrauma comes and casualty was a peripheral hospital which does not even have emergency uh, x-ray facility. It was clear, clear case of head injury, he, it, the he was, first aid was done, patient was taken to a tertiary care hospital. The neurosurgeon or surgery resident shouted him like anything, have you talked to anyone, have you discussed is there bed or not, is there a ventilator or not. And 
attendance were there, they got irritated, naturally. But is it a mistake of doctor? But doctor cannot build ventilators. It is a governance failure, a government's failure. Second scenario, a corporate hospital, MNC resident is there. Unknown patient comes after road traffic accident, hemodynamically unstable. On ultrasound, it is found that spleen rupture is there. Emergency OT has to perform, surgery should perform. Rule says XYZ amount to be deposited before taking to OT. Doctors are there, facilities are there, but patient cannot deposit money because brought by police, there is nobody accompanying. Is doctor responsible for managing policy of the hospital? Can doctor deposit from his pocket? Who is responsible? So coming to the topic which I thought of discussing that how can we build our multifacetal or multifactorial abilities or competence. So myself, I was a medical doctor, then I practiced emergency medicine for over five years. I decided to pursue MBA because I thought there must be solution. And looking at the other side, my friends corporate are thought earning very well. Now that myth has been busted, I know. So I did my MBA from I am now. After achieving gold medal, now I am working with various healthcare sector centers, pharmaceuticals on their operations and strategy part. But I can say, doctors have all abilities. They can do all these things if their curriculum or there is a touch base on these aspects, like financial planning aspect, communication aspect, just awareness of sensitization is needed. I won't say doctor should do full-fledged MBA completely. There's no need to integrate MBA curriculum in MBBS curriculum, but some topics, how they can operationally manage within given resources, because a lot of initiatives we saw, which people are taking on their own, and it has given fruitful results. If these initiatives are channelized, and is channelized, the results would be amplified. That curriculum we have to build in, and another aspect, the community thinks that doctors have delusion grandio, but we have to replace with the magnanimity. If in any conflict setup, any patient, any attendant shouts at us, the ego part that I am doctor, that comes from our reflexive brain. Let's go to a reflective brain. Why a person is shouting? So if we start thinking from that perspective, if we start from magnanimity, the conflicts of patient, community, or doctor conflict would reduce to zero. We definitely need a legal framework to have a deterrence, but there are some things which we can do, and that's where I believe we are devising MNC medicine because MNC professionals are at the forefront of the hospital. They would be at the first level or first uh, point of contact whenever conflicts happen. So if not MBBS, then at least post-grad curriculum of MNC medicine, we can integrate these aspects. And as my previous speaker was saying, are doctors good at maths? Yes, doctors are good at maths. We do a lot of mental calculations. As Ma'am was talking on about dosing, in emergency physician does a lot of mental calculations on how much dose I have to give. So we are good at maths. Maths is just not about integration, derivation, formula. It's about mental ability, critical thinking. Doctors are very good at these things. Are doctors good at communication? Definitely. When you can break bad news in calm manner, no, there is no communication better than breaking a bad news. It's not speaking fluent English. It's not speaking with confident English. It's about how you can manage situation. Only thing we have to manage our workload, manage our awareness, and manage resources. So I'll just end my talk here. And uh, I believe message has been delivered. And would love to see if EM India integrates these aspects successfully, either as core curriculum or extra curriculum. But we need to inculcate, make among physicians as managers, as leaders, so that they not only treat patients, they treat situations. Thank you. So that was the last speaker of uh, the Dr. Pranagar National CME. Again, if you look at all the string of speakers and how they were selected and how they were engaged, you see uh, that a lot of thought process went into the preparation for these talks. You saw some speakers getting emotional and trying to express what went in their hearts when they were speaking out. That is what the CME was all about. It was bringing out the voice 
of the inner self and presenting a personality which is built on years of experience, which is worldly, not only patient oriented. There's a lot to learn from every talk, whether it's gaming, whether it's the art of education, whether it's a different field going from emergency medicine into business management, whether it is understanding family challenges at home, your child not being able to have a baby, infertility issues, all these things, personal mishaps of having heart disease, personal failures in life. What is the reality in the system around us? How can we change that? What are the new vistas in which you could engage yourself in? We talked about design, small things, like how can you design better? So bringing out the personality of a doctor, which is totally wholesome, makes us a better person. Residency training teaches you only how to see patients. It doesn't make the personality you want to become. That is why we have only a few personalities who succeed. Everybody else just recedes. So you do, in life, you don't only want to survive, but you also want to thrive. And that is the mission of EM India. And whenever I do a Congress, I tell my scientific team, they're all young, they're all graduates, do something which is unique and deep and comes from the heart. We are not a cocktails and dinner conference. My organization is not a cocktails and dinner organization. It was not built on the fundamental of getting pharma support and coming and staying in five-star hotels. So today's CME success belongs to each one of you who sat through this nine hours and did not sleep. This was the first CME I've ever seen that I've not seen the people sleeping. That is very important. It's very, very important there's the first CME where no, we are not interested in points, but people are here. And I'm very sure this concept will grow. These 16 are now empowered to find the next 16. Their job is to find the next 16. And that's why they signed up for this. So they have to find the next 16 for next year. And that's how it's going to grow. And they will be the mentors for the next 16. The 16th speaker couldn't be here. She will be participating next year. She got COVID yesterday. So she couldn't be here. So she will be speaking next year. Another speaker backed out because he had a death in the family. So these things happen. That's why we have more speakers planned. We know that there'll be a mishap. But the most important part is that speaking out is very important. And a CME is not a cut and paste lecture. A CME is a concept where you think about life, where you learn from others and their experiences and others who can show you the way, the way they have experienced their life. And it's a one year process. So when I was having lunch, about 23 or 24 people came to me and said, sir, we want to do it next year from here. I will not take their names, they are sitting there. They gave, sir, I want to speak next year. I want to speak out. I want to express myself. I said, you can come through the process. There is a process. When we announce the CME call, you can register, you can send us your concept, and then we will start coaching you. And we started off with 24, and some people got apprehensive, said, oh, we can't speak. Now those people are calling, sir, we saw this, we want to speak next year. So if I count, I think I have 30 plus speakers for 18 slots next year already. And that is the power of this Congress. And this will grow with time. It is very hard to host such a Congress. It is very hard to host such a con conference. So these cut-paste, copy-paste artists who want to replicate this model, I would love for them to replicate because they are not going to be able to defeat me because it takes that much hard work. So copycats can come, but you cannot coach. And how I could do it? Because I am a TED speaker myself. I went through this process myself and then transferred this process to a new model for medicine in India. So never preach unless you practice it. That has been my mission. When I talk about public health, I'm a master's in public health. When I talk about business management, I have done an MBA in finance and international banking. When I talk about emergency medicine, I have a board certification in emergency medicine. When I talk about internal medicine, I am DNB in internal medicine in India. I have the credentials, then I can talk. 
There is a big difference between Bol Bachchan and Amita Bachchan. Just remember this. You will find 95 people as Bol Bachchan. Cut paste artist. Whatever is available in the book, cut paste. They will rob slides from slides show shiteshare.com. I saw a few people taking photographs. Take photographs, no problem. But put your mind to make a slide out of it. That will help you. That will help you to grow yourself. That's very, very important. I would like to have comments from you to help us become better. If you have something to say, you're more than welcome as we prepare to close this CME. Because everybody has a voice. If you all want to express what you thought about the CME, would you, what would you like to hear next year? We could keep those themes also. People are also encouraged to speak about what their topics, but if there are themes, we could suggest that. So if there are any suggestions, the mic is all yours. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Agarwal, a few closing comments. Honor all the speakers. Uh, I think this was really a unique CME, and it was a learning experience for me also. I learned a lot from all the speakers, and congratulations to all the speakers. And Sagar, it was okay. It was really a good uh, CME which you, you, you really conducted well, and you really uh, coached every speaker well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We were having the convocation, which is going to be a grand event. Uh, after this, that is the biggest event of EM India. It's going to be very grand. And you will see a convocation which is not even done in any university. And again, we do it differently. So you will see that convocation. Two All India Institute of Medical Sciences directors are coming. Never ever happened. An array of experts are there, so please attend. We have also the Indus EM Awards, which are given every year. These are national awards. You can attend those and they are part of the convocation ceremony. This CME took us nearly one year to conceive, seven months of practice. I'm very thankful to architect Ms. Joshi to step in at the last minute when a speaker of, uh, was not able to do But you can see the esteemed speaker, she won the Infosys Award last night, so big clap for her. <laughs> so. So speakers who have spoken have got solid experience. And we didn't want to repeat. We didn't, I didn't want to speak. And I didn't want to give a talk or anything. I just wanted to make sure that others got a voice to speak. Me, Sanjeev, Bhoi, Dr. Agarwal, we have been teaching for a long, long time. And we realized along the way that there is so much data available online, lectures available online, podcast, FOMED, video, audio, YouTube, that, that is not what a conference should look like. Conference is something new. So our workshops are new, our courses are new, our CME is new, the way we have laid out the scientific program is new, everybody has a voice to speak. Next year we are going to increase the number of coaches who will help you to make good presentations. So we are going to keep a powerhouse of people to keep good presentations to help you to make good slides to make you present better. Because we want you to become be better. We are not one of those who will say, no, 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 no. You come to us, you become better. You go home happy. You go home satisfied. You feel that, oh, I, somebody gave us respect. Somebody gave us power. We just didn't register and roam around and see Pune city and come back. And that is what the main mission of this Congress was. Next year, we will host this Congress at a, another beautiful location. I will not declare it now. But it's going to be very nice and it's going to be phenomenal next year. And already the scientific committee has met and set the theme for next year. Because we are a lot busy. So we'll have this and six weeks later we are in Turkey for the World Congress of Emergency Medicine. Four weeks later Dr. Bowie is giving a plenary address at the Mediterranean Congress of Emergency Medicine. So we finish and we wrap up there. Then we, as soon as the World Congress gets over, the Israeli Emergency Medicine Congress, which is one of our premier partners, our advisors for developing emergency medicine in India, the Israeli uh, Emergency Security Forum, we go for that every two years. So we have to go there, where our workshop, our ultrasound workshop, 
will be offered in Israel. That is a very big achievement. They are not teaching us, we are teaching them. So, that is at the level at which we are functioning. Uh, we will pre prepare uh, the presentations now at the hands of Dr. Agarwal for all our speakers. I would like to, uh, Dr. Bhoi, who has been very calm and silent, to say a few words. He also is the director of WHO Collaborating Center for Emergency and Trauma. Thank you, Sagar. I was giving a lot of voice rest for myself, you know, before I speak. And it is really nostalgic to see after so many years of hard work, dedication by all of you, we are seeing here that when we began this journey, you know, along with Professor Agrawal, uh, 2004 when I joined as an emergency doctor, 2002 I joined as an emergency doctor at Ames, post-parliament attack. Eight of us under the leadership of uh, Dr. Agarwal, and then the journey began, and now you can see over the years. And Sagar came, then it the they say Katana, there is a Hindi proverb, you know, famous proverb I can't recollect, but Karva Manta Gya. This is something like that. Those who are are they saying so? It became a movement, and now you can see. So happy to see that almost we are talking. Uh, with a lot of milestones which we have achieved during this journey, sir. Like, it is just like eating a elephant, big elephant story by Dr. Patanjali Nair, you know, biting bite by bite, digesting it well, and now progressing, giving a big leap. Like we did Chandrayaan 3, with a lot of failures and a lot of this thing, it was a, so it is just like that. Every effort which we do as a group, as a team, you know, really sees the light of the day. It's a journey, so it's all nostalgic. I never thought that some aberrations keeps on coming. They will always be there when you walk, you know, during your journey, or any journey you do, you know. So I never felt that there is any problem because of recent NMC guidelines, but then nothing. It is just, we are, on other, we are there on that, and uh, I'm sure uh, as a group we will do. And, you know, happy to hear the stories of many leaders who joined the, during this uh, the, the journey. Like uh, Prerna spoke about the first, the, uh, uh, the famous, you know, the, the, you can say, what is that, phrase from a, you know, in the song, you know, Choti Si Asha, and what she started with, brilliant. That was really brilliant, and she told her journey, how she travels the journey of, Casualty to emergency medicine. It's a journey. That is what I my tagline was uh, when uh, I wrote in my email. You must be there who were receiving that. So similar journey I felt. <coughs> Prerna was doing that, and everybody this riveting stories of many of the leaders which we have uh, gathered here. And not to forget what Dr. Patanjali sir came, and he started his lecture with you can see a lot of passion, a lot of passion, and I could I could see that uh, some days when he was a, the so-called casualty medical officer, that came into that, you can just small skit. It was not a, you know, what is he, never practiced it. I, I don't think he practiced it and it just happened. And this is all happened. So this is some of the things, and uh, Sagar was so kind of him that during this journey, uh, I had a dream actually to uh, see, you know, when I do something along with WHO. World Health Organization. So that was my dream when I was a young MBBS graduate, sir, just to tell you. Never told you this story. And uh, during this journey of work, you recognized the, uh, the worth in, in myself. And then you said that, you know, that let's work together in this journey because I, we were anyway doing the work on that. But you gave that impetus and the public health you know, vision of transforming emergency care, I learned from Dr. Patanjali Dev Nair. So that, thank you very much for showing up that, sir. And because of his, you know, that small, you know, direction, the, the important directions in, in during this journey were towards developing a holistic system of emergency care system. The thought process changed from me being a clinician to a system thinker. 
that was the journey I traversed with his direction. Now we are working with almost uh, Southeast Asian region. As uh, Patanjali sir, sir said, the whole community, we are global experts. We have homegrown expertise, which we have done. Now we can read there to, you know, produce, export our expertise across the globe. So that is what with this. So with these words, I thank all of us who listen to me and thank to our organization who have been tirelessly working uh, in this group. Thank you very much. With this, we are going to coming to the end of this wonderful CME, which is going to be uh, the part of each successive EM India conference. And I feel very delighted that the EM India conference, which was hosted by DYP at DPU, where I had a little to contribute, has started. It has become a trend setter, and where we are going to continue with this wonderful CME. All the talk topics were really wonderful and I'm sure that people are going to enjoy it. I have already shared the YouTube link with all the groups and I'm sure I'll keep on having the feedbacks that the talks were really wonderful. So I congratulate Dr. Sagar for this wonderful idea and I request Dr. Praveen Agarwal sir to come here so that we can felicitate all the speakers <laughs> by a trophy. Can I request Dr. Tanishka to come here? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Hasmukh Jain. Just be prepared that that is the next. Dr. Patanjali Dev Nair. Dr. Prerana Batra. Dr. Indrani Sardesai. Dr. Shreyas Patel, please. Congratulations. Dr. Vimal Krishnan Surendran Pillai. Dr. Manu Ayan. Dr. Vivek Chauhan. Dr. Ajay Ambalkatte. Not there? Not there? Not there. Okay. Uh, architect Mrs. Pratima Joshi. Hmm. 
Professor Archana was he there? No. no. Dr. Raymond Kumar. <laughs> and last but not the least, Dr. Ankit Kumar Sahu.